Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I'm your host, On Civil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the U.S. Supreme Court, and I hope you're having a great day. For today's story, we cover the second part of oral arguments in the twin cases of Net Choice versus Florida versus Texas. Previously, we covered Florida's oral arguments. And now we're going to cover Texas's. Both the states of Florida and Texas passed law that requires social media companies such as X and other social media companies to carry content regardless of its viewpoint. So the social media companies would no longer be able to delete content, moderate content, remove content, throttle content, or otherwise discriminate against content based on the viewpoints of that content. Of course, they'd still be able to remove anything that's illegal. They'd still be able to act against anyone who is trying to commit denial of service or otherwise abusing terms of service in different ways, but they would not be able to act against people merely because of their viewpoint, because they're Republican, because they're conservative, because they're pro this or anti that. They'd be forced to cover and carry all traffic. Well, NetChoice is a organization that opposed both these bills and both these laws, I should say, because they, of course they both became law. And in both Florida and Texas, they got appealed. Florida's version was ruled to be unconstitutional by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Texas's version was ruled to be constitutional by the 5th Circuit Court of Appeals. And for what it's worth, both these decisions might be correct because, of course, the broad strokes I've just given you is not the details. And the details, of course, matter. Although they were both trying to do ostensibly the same thing, they had differences in how they went about it. And the differences could, of course, matter. So it is quite possible that both the 11th Circuit striking down Florida and the 5th Circuit upholding Texas are both correct. Or maybe they're neither correct or some other kind of combination. We previously listened to the oral arguments as it relates to Florida's version of its law, and now we're going to cover Texas's versions of this law. And the essential argument basically boils down to, at least in major part, what is a social media company? How can it be thought of? What is it? Is it like a newspaper? where they're writing their own content, editing their own content, publishing their own content? Is it more like a newsstand that's merely distributing paper content? Is it more like the telegraph or the phone company that has to accept all traffic? AT&T cannot discriminate against you based on you being Republican or Democrat. They have to accept all traffic, all calls for all purposes. They have to accept all traffic, just like the post office or FedEx has to accept all letters that come into its offices. They cannot discriminate against the viewpoint of the person. They, of course, can discriminate in other ways. They can require the packages to be a certain size or a certain whatever. There's other ways they can conform. And in the case of FedEx, of course, can require you to pay. But they can't discriminate on viewpoint because companies like AT&T are considered to be a common carrier, just like a railroad, just like an airline. Again, they can't discriminate against you unless you otherwise violate the rules. The, the airlines have to accept everyone. The train company has to accept everyone. The bus company has to accept everyone. They can't discriminate against you. They have to accept all traffic. So what kind of category are we in? Are we in the category of being a newspaper? Are we in the category of being a television station? Are we in the category of being a movie producer where we're completely in control of our own content? It's our message. We have the right to edit our message. It's our voice. We're the ones speaking. Get off our lawn. Are we in the, are we in the category of the telegraph of old or the phone company of today? We, or the, the, are there parcel deliverer? In the form of FedEx, UPS, are we merely transmitting someone else's message and we're merely the conduits, but not speaking? So maybe we have no First Amendment interest in that way? Or are we something in between? As we're trying to figure out whether or not and to what degree these social media companies can be regulated. So what are they like is a major part of this debate. Now, social media companies, for the most part, are, of course, the messages of other people. They're not exclusively the messages of other people because even Twitter has a Twitter account, even Facebook has a Facebook account. And so it's not exclusively their messages, but they are principally a platform. They are not principally the publisher as Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act makes clear. 
So maybe they don't have a First Amendment interest because it's not their voice. It's not their speech. The First Amendment only applies if it's your speech after all. If it's not your speech, you don't have a First Amendment right. So that's sort of the thing that we're talking about, trying to delineate this. So we're going to listen to the oral arguments in the case of Net Choice versus Paxton, the Attorney General of Texas, as they debate Texas's version of this law as we try to figure out what the Supreme Court is likely to do when it comes to whether or not, and to the degree, the states can regulate, and more the point, force social media companies to transmit messages they might not like. Let's go ahead and get started with this. And I have to change the audio source real fast so you guys will hear it because that would be good. Okay, let's change it to this one. That would be more helpful. Okay, and let's scroll back and try again. That did not work. Okay, properties. Ah. Uh, Let's try that one. Third time's a charm. We will hear argument next in case 22555, Net Choice versus Paxton. Mr. Clement. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I don't want to proceed as if I wasn't here for the first argument, so let me. So these, are, these cases were argued on the same day. They were argued back to back, and Paul Clement argued in them both, hence the joke. So he, he participated in the oral arguments relating to Florida, and now he's participating in the oral arguments relating to Texas. So that's the joke there. Let me focus on what's different about Texas. One thing, fortunately, that's, diff that's different about Texas is its definition of social media platforms excludes websites. So we can just put that Gmail issue to one side for when we're talking about Texas. The other thing it excludes, of course, is websites that are primarily focused on news, sports, and entertainment. In the First Amendment business, we call that content-based discrimination. And that's just one of the many reasons that this statute is, dare I say it, facially unconstitutional. Constitutional. The other thing that's different is in some respects this statute operates more simply because it forbids my clients from engaging in viewpoint discrimination. Now, we're used to thinking that viewpoint discrimination is a bad thing and that government shouldn't do it, and of course, when governments do it, it is a bad thing. But when editors or speakers engage in viewpoint discrimination, that is their First Amendment right. It is also absolutely vital to the operation of these websites because if you have to be viewpoint neutral, that means that if you have materials that are involved in suicide prevention, you also have to have materials that advocate suicide promotion. Or if you have materials on your site that are pro-Semitic, then you have to let on materials onto your site that are anti-Semitic. Which, by the way, just for the parade of horribles before we depart too far, would also be true for common carriers generally. So AT&T, as I said, as a common carrier, Verizon as a common carrier, the phone companies generally as a common carrier have to accept all traffic. If you want to get on the phone and spread pro-suicide messages, they can't stop you. If you want to spread anti-suicide messages, they can't stop you. The same thing for UPS. They, can't, they have to accept all traffic, all letters that come into their purview. They can't discriminate based on, on viewpoint. Or in fact, they can't discriminate based on traffic, just period. They have to accept all traffic. So that's one of the things about being a common carrier. Incidentally, which also insulates them from liability because they have no choice. They have to accept it, so they have no liability. So you might be in trouble for the message you're sending because you might be breaking the law, depending on exactly what you're doing, you know, as you're spreading your message. But that's your problem, not the common carrier. So before we get too deep into the parade of horribles, of this would mean that we have to accept the pro-suicide messages too. Yes, that's what it would mean. We have to accept the pro-suicide messages too. But that would be the correct legal conclusion. So, you know, slow your roll, Mr. Paxton, or slow your roll, uh, Ken, you know, over here. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, it's... Uh, it's, you know. And that is a formula for making these websites. Uh Robin says what? What part about that was confusing? Or was I not confused? Was I, un was I not confusing? The phone company can't stop you in what message you send because they're a common carrier. If you pick up the phone and you make a phone call, you can make a phone call about anything and they can't stop you. That's a common carrier. They can't stop you. What part about that is confusing? I'm unclear. 
Is this hearing about Facebook private messages or wall posts? This would be messages in the public, mostly. These would be messages in what could be said to be exposed to the public. So this would be tweets. This isn't really contemplating DMs in the most part, I don't think. I'd have to go read the statute, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're mostly talking about messages that would be exposed to the public in some way. Uh, very unpopular to both users and advertisers, so it is absolutely vital. The other thing that makes Texas a little different is, at least in passing the law, uh, Texas was even more explicit in relying on the common carrier analogy, as if simply labeling websites common carriers makes the First Amendment pr problems go away. And that is fundamentally wrong for two basic reasons. One, these companies don't operate actually as common carriers. They all have terms of use that exclude varying degrees of content. And second, Texas can't simply convert them into public common carriers by its say-so. I welcome the court's questions. Uh, Mr. Clement, if these laws go into effect, uh, what? how would your clients, uh, what steps would they take? Lenovo says, I think mail and phone are different because those are more like private messages. Um, well, not necessarily, because although you wouldn't normally think of it this way, uh, you can send a message via mail not necessarily to just one person. And people do that, especially if you're advertising. You can send a message to 100 people, 1,000 people, a million people, and it's still protected by the same rule. And how many people are on this phone call, right? How many people are on the other, how many people are participating in this phone call? Is it two people, is it 20 people, is it 200 people? You have no idea how many people are on this phone call. So yeah, the distinction I don't know is as clean as you might suspect, uh, but you know, Fair, you know, there, there's that. Take to comply. So, I mean, you know, one thing that they would... Including, I'm sorry, just in, in, in particular addressing the situation of compliance in Texas and Florida as opposed to nationwide. Sure. So, I mean, you know, one of the things that they would contemplate, at least, you know, with respect to Texas in the first instance, is there some way to just withdraw from the market in uh, Texas and Florida? And, of course, Texas had that in mind in the statute and specifically said, uh, by, we, we essentially have to do business in Texas and we can't discriminate against users based on their geographic location in Texas. So if we lose this, including, the, you know, the idea that we can be forced to engage in expressive activity in Texas, then I think we would fundamentally have to change Tony would you please Ma, would you please time out Swamp Bear for a day and take whatever dispute he has to discord thank you uh, the way that we provide our service in order to engage in view in, in, in order to provide anything like the service that we want to while not uh, engaging in viewpoint discrimination we basically have to uh, eliminate certain areas of speech entirely so we just couldn't talk about suicide prevention anymore because we're not going to talk about suicide promotion I guess we couldn't have pro-semitic speech because we're not going to have anti-semitic speech so we'd have to figure out some way to try to to engage in even more uh, content moderation or editorial discretion to try to get us to a level uh, where we're more benign and somehow we, we don't run afoul of Texas's law. And then on the disclosure provisions, the record here reflects that, that you know, YouTube would have to basically uh, increase its disclosure and appeal process basically a hundredfold in order to comply with Texas law. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about the common carrier issue because I do think it's a central part of their defense. There was an illusion earlier about somehow Section 230 treats, uh, treats my clients, the websites, as common carriers. To the contrary, Congress specifically, and this is 47 U.S.C. 223 uh, subsection 6, um, which we cite in our briefs, it specifically is a congressional provision in the same act of Congress that says that interactive computer services should not be treated as common carriers. And I think more broadly, the whole thrust of 230 is don't just be a common carrier. Don't just put through all of this material. We don't want that. We want you to exercise editorial discretion in order to uh, keep some of the worst of the worst off this site. It now, does that, though, only with I, all that's true, and I, I acknowledge all that, but it also says uh, that's true only if it's not your speech. And that seems to be in tension a bit with your suggestion that everything is your speech. Um, and I think Justice Barrett pointed out an interesting uh, feature of that, which is these algorithms arrange, sort, uh, promote certain, certain posts by users and not others. And is that not 
your, and I'm not yours, but your client's speech. So I don't think it's our speech in the way that Section 230 talks about the speech. And I think for these purposes, you have to distinguish between the speech that is the editorial function and the underlying user speech. I understand that, and I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. But there is some editorial speech, your term, going on, right? I, I think that's right. And, and so I, the, the carrier would be liable for its editorial speech. I don't think so. I mean, you know, I did actually reread the brief that I filed, at least in the Gonzalez case, and I think that you could make a strong argument based on the text of that statute that that kind of editorial sort of functioning is not is, is not something that causes you to lose your 230 protection. So it's speech for purposes of the First Amendment, your speech, your editorial control, but when we get to Section 230, your submission is that that isn't your speech. Yes, as a matter of statutory construction, because otherwise Section 230 ends up being... Okay. Paul Clement trying to have his cake and eat it too. It's a difficult road to try to, 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 to walk this line, but he wants it to be both his speech and not, or more to the point, his client. He wants it both to be his client's speech and not be his client's speech at the same time. Now, Section 230 potentially allows him to do that, but he has to, of course, be a bit careful about how he walks that tightrope, so... He's going to try to walk the tightrope. So, okay. Self-defeating. Because, again, the whole point of Section 230 was to promote that editorial discretion. And this court, you know, this court wrestled with these issues. They're hard issues. And I, I certainly applaud the instinct that you shouldn't resolve them here. But I don't think just by recognizing that my clients are engaged in editorial discretion when they make those decisions about what's going to ultimately go to the individualized screen that a user's going to see when they tap into their their website or their application. I don't think that's the kind of speech that is you're talking about in the 230 context. And if you did, I think you would defeat the fundamental purpose of 230 because they wanted you, they wanted my clients and others to exercise that editorial discretion to keep the bad material With out. With respect to other people's speech. So it seems like we have speech and then we have speech. You, you, you can't, you literally, and this is, again, I'm happy to argue that case right now if we want to, but you can't have... Well, no, it's a, it's a really hard question for us, and it's perfectly relevant here and very important because, of course, 230 preempts things, um, and we don't know how much of this law it preempts. Absolutely, but this law is unconstitutional in all its applications, and certainly in its, it has no plainly legitimate sweep, so you mm. don't have to reach the 230 question directly here, and I would simply say that when you're reading those statutory terms in 230, you wouldn't sweep in editorial discretion, because if you do, you will defeat the fundamental purpose of Section 230, well, what do we which do is to empower editorial discretion. Well, I just wanted to raise with you the question I raised with the, with the Solicitor General, um, who offered a thoughtful response. But many of your clients' terms of service, while reserving some editorial discretion, and I think about most of them as, as, as speaking about the things covered by 230, obscenity, etc., go out of their way to promise an open forum to all members of the public and go out of their way to say we don't endorse what other people say on this site and go out of their way to say all views shall flourish. Um, now, that's not true for all of your clients, but it's true for some of them and many of them. What do we do about that? So I would say that, you know, and it's true of some of my clients and some more than others, and I think all of those terms of service, as the general said, go on to say, and there's certain things, though, that are out of bounds. And I do think it's, it's, it's just a factually true thing that my clients, in the main, as long as you kind of stay within the lines, they actually do want to promote a, uh, an open dialogue and a fair dialogue. And if you look at the Center for Growth and Opportunity brief, it shows you that actually some conservative voices have really flourished on these websites. Ben Shapiro and Daily Wire are killing it on Facebook. And that shows you that you know, we, we do want a broad discussion, but there's some stuff that is just, you know, out of the lines. And I don't think it's as simple to say, well, that's just the 230 stuff, because, again, we had a debate about what otherwise objectionable means. But I also think that my clients are getting a lot of pressure to be particularly careful about things that are damaging to youths. And I think in that context, they want to you know, sort of err on the side of keeping some bad material off. Well, you but, mentioned that a few times. Let me just press the other way, though. Doesn't it also hold that, on your view, um, part of the editorial discretion of a platform would be uh, that it could use algorithms designed specifically 
to uh, try to attract teens to addiction or suicide, depression, those kinds of things as well. That would be part of their editorial discretion, too. So a website, I don't think my clients, because my clients are working hard. I don't, I don't mean to cast aspersions on anyone, but I, I think it's a natural consequence of your, your position, isn't it? It, there, there would be protected First Amendment activity with that very different website with a business model that I don't think would stay in business very long. And it is possible, as the, you know, as the, as the United States has pointed out in its brief, that if you have a different concern and you identify a different government interest, that maybe the government might be able to do something, particularly if it does it in a content neutral way, to address some of those concerns. But to get back to something Justice Kavanaugh pointed out before, I mean, I actually think that both Texas and Florida have been pretty aggressive about their government interest here being something that is not just not a legitimate interest in the First Amendment context, but is affirmatively prohibited, which is the idea that we're going to level the – we're going to amplify some voices and we're going to make certain – but put burdens on private parties so that some voices can be louder than others or some people can get a boost from what they're getting in the marketplace of ideas. And the only place this court has ever allowed that was in Turner. And, I mean, Justice Kavanaugh, you pointed out that one of the key things there was, was content neutral. But I actually think the critical thing in Turner is that bottleneck or chokehold on the content that went into individual houses. And I think that's what made what was otherwise an impermissible Municipal government interest, a legitimate government interest in that narrow context. And maybe you could say the same thing. I mean, I don't know if red line is still good law, but that's the same idea that there's like a scarcity rationale. But there's no scarcity rationale in the Internet. And this, course, this court said that in 1997 in the Reno case. Mr. Where, I'm sorry. No, no. Can I ask you about um, a distinction between two possible kinds of applications of the Texas law? So one is the application that prevents you from keeping out certain speech that you want to keep out. You said anti-Semitic speech. It could be any of a number of things. Um, as I understand it, the Texas law also prevents you also from doing something else, which is suppose um, you wanted to prevent anti-Semites from posting anything. You know, you want to, you just wanted a, a, to say that they're a class of people. We're not even going to let them post cat videos. Um, should we think about that uh, set of applications differently? I don't think you should think of it radically differently. I mean, it's a different application, but I think it's the same idea, which is there are some speakers, and I think this is going to be, you know, very few, but there are some speakers where they are so associated with a particular viewpoint that they're, it, it informs essentially all of their speech. That idea slightly uh, amuses me. I don't know if that's possible, but I, I do I do uh, I'm slightly amused by the concept that there might be someone, for example, who's such a, such a Nazi that even their cat videos can be said to be Nazi propaganda. Somehow the, somehow the perfectly innocent cat, cat video is tainted by the association. That, that thought amuses me as a possibility. I don't know if anyone else finds that funny, but it amused me. And it also affects the speech of other people in the forum. If you have a white supremacist on your speech forum and they're posting there, it's going to cause a lot of other people to say, what is that person doing? What's going on here? Why are all the dog photos white? Why are all the dogs I mean, it's white? It's going to fundamentally change <laughs> the dynamic on the website. And I think a website that's trying to promote a particular discussion uh, has an, a, a First Amendment right to exclude those people. And in practice, this is, you know, what, oh, what is used to exclude uh, sort of, you know, sexual predators, which is something, again, that the government can't do, Packingham, but, uh, but Facebook does. Uh, and there's certain other people with, you know, just very distinct viewpoints where it's, in a sense, we know, we know the viewpoint, the viewpoint is problematic, um, even if the particular post is not. But Mr. Mr. Clement, I just wanted to follow up on that because it seems to me that Justice Kagan's question kind of gets to the distinction in 303 Creative between turning people away and the speech that you have. And so if you think about it as silencing someone who you let on your platform, then that seems more like speech or content moderation to the extreme, for example. But I assume that the implication of your answer to Justice Kagan is that you could tell the anti-Semite, we're not open for business to you, right? 
You can tell that person that our speech forum is not open to you. And I think that's what makes it different that Texas uh, Mark is Mark asked a good question. We'll just take a second to answer this. Says, why do all these discussions turn into hypothetical examples? Shouldn't the certain question be whether a forum owner has the right to allow or disallow speech on his or her forum? We, we ask hypothetical questions to test the principle. So someone comes out with the principle and says, here is the rule. Right, because that's that's what the Supreme Court is trying to figure out. What is the rule? That's the whole thing, right? What is the rule? And so the advocates say, okay, I propose the following rule. And so then basically it becomes, oh, really? Do you now? All right, let's try to figure out every possible way to break your rule. Let's see if you really believe that. Let's really test that. Let's ask a whole bunch of hypotheticals and a whole bunch of different ways to see if that rule really holds up. So yeah, the, the, the point is to test the rule by exposing it to a whole bunch of examples to see if it's still the rule. And so maybe you say, okay, well that example, I can't agree with that. So, okay, maybe that's not the rule, right? If you weren't able to, you say, okay, you're right. You know, I can't defend that. So it's like, okay, so that's not the rule. You're wrong. And you can also, of course, get to the point where you try just you just try to defend it no matter what, right? No, this is the rule. Come higher, come hell or high water, and you just no matter what hypothetical you stick by it. But the absurdity is proven by the examples too. It's like, well, that can't be the right answer. I mean, it's the right answer by your It's the right answer by your rule, but the 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 conclusion doesn't flow. So it's about testing the rule. That's what we do. So it's like, okay, let's test your rule, you know, a hundred different ways and see if it see if it's the rule. So yeah, you know, that's that's what appellate arguments are a lot about. So that makes sense. Really, on these speech-oriented platforms, and so I think if you're in the business of speech and you have somebody, and again, this is not sort of other prohibited statuses. This is viewpoint, and so you are a notorious anti-Semite. We do not want you to participate in this conversation. Religion, then, like sure, and and I want to have a Catholic website. I can keep off somebody who's a notorious Protestant. I mean, I want to I want to preserve <laughs> I want to preserve the nature of the discussion on my forum, and it's a private forum and the government can't tell me um, as a private party let the Protestant into the Catholic party. I don't think so. Mr. Coleman, can I ask you about section Fair. 2? I don't think anything has been said about it so far. So you say that section 2's individualized explanation requirements violate the First Amendment because they impose a massive burden, right? That's your argument? I mean, I. it seems to me that the European Union has imposed exactly the same, pretty much the same individualized explanation requirement on anybody who operates there that Texas has uh, imposed. And I, I'm not saying that whatever the European Union says is okay is constitutional here. But just on the practical question of whether it's too much of a burden, if it's not too much of a burden for your clients to do it in Europe, how can it be too much of a burden for them to do it here? So as I understand the requirements, they are different. They are materially different. This, uh, you know, the, and, and in a sense, the European Union um, provision has sort of a built-in kind of, you know, reasonably practical uh, provision right into what you have to do. You only have to do what's reasonably practical. This is an absolute requirement to respond to every, uh, you know, every takedown, and that's be over a billion takedowns of comments in a quarter for YouTube. And then there's also this appeal process, which I don't think is uh, coextensive with the process in Europe. So just as a practical matter, I think this is more burdensome. But as you said, the First Amendment does not apply uh, in Europe. And Preach. I think that having this kind of disclosure requirement on what is really an editorial discretion decision is potentially I mean, hugely problematic. I mean, if you took this and said, you know, the New York Times, you have to you have to tell us why you rejected okay. my, my wedding announcement. I mean, you only take like 10 percent of the wedding announcements. You have to tell me, even if you automize that and sort of said, you know, you know, well, one, if, you know, you weren't rich enough two, if you weren't connected enough in New York social <laughs> social circles and, and three, we just didn't like the way you looked. Even and your client, you that, some, you of, would, some of your clients are humongous. And hey, if you want to say this is under 
unduly burdensome. Didn't you have some obligation in the district court to uh, try to, is it enough for you to just say, this is a huge burden, so knock this out? Well, didn't you have to provide something to show how much, what resources would be required? We, we did. And, and why a- that would be too much for the for these <laughs> megaliths? I mean, we, we, we did. There's more of a record in the Texas case than in the Florida case. Our, you know, the, the witness for YouTube in their declaration specifically said this would be a hundred times more burdensome than their current process. And so there is a record on this. It is incredibly burdensome. Justice Thomas, anything further? Justice Alito? The, the 230 argument is intriguing to me, and it's uh, the distinctions that you're drawing somehow to some degree escape me. So is it your position that you are exercising editorial discretion as to everything, let's take YouTube, as to every video that is placed on YouTube, you have exercised uh, editorial discretion that you want that on YouTube? I would say that we have exercised some editorial discretion to not sort of eliminate that from the site entirely. And as to an individual user, we've used what are typically, in in many cases, neutral algorithms, but some of them are not neutral. And even in Tomna, the briefs, I think, made quite clear that, you know, although that at a certain point some of the algorithms were neutral as between rice pilaf and terrorism, there were other efforts to affirmatively get terrorist stuff off of those sites. And so, So, I mean, if you were a newspaper and you published uh, the content that appears in every single one of the videos on YouTube that you, you allow to be uh, included, you would be liable potentially for uh, the content of those, that material. And I, I don't understand the rationale for 230 if it wasn't that you can't be held responsible for that because this is really not your message. Either it's your message or it's not your message. I don't understand how it can be both. It's your, it's your message when you want to escape state regulation, but it's not your message when you want to Fair escape points. liability under state tort law. So I don't really think we're being inconsistent, and what I would, I would try to draw the analogy just to a good old-fashioned anthology. If I put together an anthology of 20 short stories, everybody understands that the underlying short stories are still the product of the, auth- of, the, of the individual author, but as the anthologist, as the editor of this compilation who decided which 20 got in, which ones didn't, I'm responsible for those editorial d- discussions, those decisions. Those are both protected First Amendment decisions. You can distinguish between the underlying material and the editorial decisions. Now, at common law, the publisher was responsible for both. And so they were still liable for what the, the republishing the author's work. And that's precisely what Congress wanted to get rid of in 230. And they wanted to essentially give our clients an incentive to weed out of the anthologies the stuff that was harmful for children and problematic. And that's why I don't think it works to say, oh, well, then that's your speech, so you're liable under 230. Because it's that editorial control, the weeding out the bad stuff. That was the whole point of 230, to empower well, that. I don't know how you could be, how a, a publisher could be liable for, uh, well, I I take that back, for fiction. But certainly if it was, I I mean, if you, back in the day when uh, some written material was considered to be obscene, you put together an anthology that included obscene material, you could be sued. Today, if you put together an anthology of essays, nonfiction writing, and there's defamation in there, then the publisher could be sued. Even the uh, publisher, well, we exercise editorial discretion. That doesn't shield you from liability. Not at common law. And that's why Congress had to come in with 230. But what Congress did is it looked at the common law and it said, oh, this is problematic. Because the only way you can avoid liability at common law is if you act as a conduit and let everything out. And once you start keeping out a little bit of porn, then you're responsible for the porn that slips through. And that's not practical on the Internet. And that's why we have 230. the history of two, the history is two thirty is pretty interesting, particularly because it involves uh, Stratman Oakman as one of the major players, uh, because there were two different decisions: one that involved Prodigy, and one that involved CompuServe. And I always forget which one was which uh, in terms of that. But one, but basically, it was. I can never remember which was which. One of them didn't censor anything, 
So one of the one of the two, Prodigy or CompuServe, let everything through. And the other one didn't. The other one removed things. And the court's decisions were, as to the service that let everything through, you're just a conduit, so you're not responsible. For the But for the people who didn't let everything through, you're an editor, and you are responsible. Because you touched it, you're responsible for it. And that was the entire uh, reason for 230. And one of the companies that was involved in the lawsuit against CompuServe or Prodigy, again, I can't remember which was which, but one of the companies that was involved in it was Stratman Oakman, which was the uh, company from Wolf of Wall Street, which is hilarious, right? Because uh, the, uh, the entire thing was basically a scam, and that guy went to jail for a long time because he was a scam artist. And it's just, it's just a little bit, of, it's an interesting piece of internet history that one of the reasons that the 230 law is the way it is today is because of Stratman Oakman, which was basically a massive fraud. So, hey, you know, sometimes that's how law happens. That's fun. Let's press on. Uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point. Let me just say something about the analogies that both sides draw to uh, the issues that were presented in prior cases. So uh, you say this is just like a newspaper, basically. It's like uh, the Miami Herald, and the states say, no, this is like uh, Western Union. It's like a telegraph company. And I, 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 think, I look at this and I say, it's really not like either of those. It's worlds away from, from both of those. It's nothing like a newspaper. A newspaper has space limitations. Uh, no matter how powerful it is, it doesn't necessarily have the same power uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as some of your clients. But put that aside, newspapers uh, overtly send messages. They typically have an editorial. They may have an editorial 365 days a year or more than one. But that's not the situation with uh, even the most prominent of your clients. So I, I don't know how we could decide this case by saying, by jumping to one side or the other of this case law. Well, Justice Scalia, let me offer two thoughts. One, this isn't the first time you're wrestling with the Internet. You wrestled with it in Reno. You wrestled with it last term in 303 Creative. And I think the gist of those cases is this is more like the newspaper or the parade organizer than it is like a common carrier. And then as to the cases, whether you think that this is different from a newspaper, I mean, the arguments that you're pointing to to say this is different are the arguments that those cases wrestled with and said didn't matter. So I know you know this, but in Torneo, it, you know, there was all this language about it being a monopolist, and that was in the context of a local political election, where if you couldn't get into the Miami Herald, like, where else were you going to go? And yet this court said that didn't matter. And the, the, also in Turnia, this court said, yes, yeah, space constraints, there are some, but th our decision doesn't turn on that. And then in Hurley, there's a lot of language in the, in the court's opinion that says, you know, this is not like much of a message, and they let some people show up even if they get there like the day of, and the only thing they're doing is like excluding these group. But of course, the exclusion was the message that they were sending, and it's the message the state was trying to prohibit, and that's kind of the same thing here, which I mean, is... If you're, if, if, let's say, YouTube were a newspaper, how much would it weigh? <laughs> well, I mean, it would, it, would, it, would, it would weigh an enormous amount, which is why, in order to make yes. it useful, there's actually more editorial discretion going on in these cases than any of other case that you've had before you. Because, it's, you know, this, people tend to focus on the, on the users that get knocked off entirely and end up on the cutting room floor. But both these statutes also regulate the way that these social websites, they, they sort of get you down to something that's actually usable to an individual user. And, in fact, if you tried to treat these entities like a true common carrier, so first in, first out, just order of, you'd open up one of these websites and it would be gobbledygook. Half the stuff wouldn't even be in a language you understood. And even if you controlled for that, you'd get all this garbage you didn't want. All right, thank you. I'd like to go back to the individualized explanation requirement. Uh, and then please remind me, what did the district court do here? Did it grant you an injunction here? And it, it was the circuit court who didn't. Yeah. So it was the district court who looked at the amount of material you submitted. And I know your declaration, YouTube said it would be a burden a hundred times more than it does now, I, I don't know what the quantification of that, whether that was quantified or not. 
was it? What, 100 percent more, 100 percent more costly, 100 percent more what? 100 percent more of its current effort, its current sort of, you know, efforts yeah, dedicated but to but we, we, we still don't know what the cost of that is and what — yeah, I mean, yeah, I, there's a lot of unknowns, but this was a facial challenge with respect to that. Um, and Texas seems to say, you don't need to do, do much. You just need to have the computer spit out w one through ten reasons. And if you have a few individualized ones, you could just explain those individualized. What do we do with that dispute? So, first Because of all, it is a facial challenge. It, uh, it, it is a facial challenge. It is a preliminary injunction. We've obviously been over some of that. There, this, here there was, you know, there wasn't just declarations. There were depositions taken. There was a record that was put together on all of this. And Texas was taking a slightly different view of what the burdens of the uh, of Section 2 were there. And so I think on, on that, if you just look at the record that was before the district court, you should affirm the district court's preliminary injunction. What I would say, though, is I also think that even, even what they say on page 44 of their red brief is that, you know, you can do this in a relatively less burdensome way as long as your uh, editorial policies are sufficiently specific and particularized. And what, what they're basically saying is, you know, you could change your editorial policies a little bit to make it easier to comply with this disclosure obligation. And that seems... That begs the are, question, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Because they're affecting... Okay. Ms. Kagan? I just, have, I just have a quick question. Um, so part of the dynamic that I think is going on in these cases is uh, the fact that this regulation is enacted by the sort of democratically elected representatives of a state. And um, I suppose that if the state's regulation of these platforms gets too burdensome, then presumably the platforms can say, forget it, we're not — going to operate in your state, and then the citizens of the state um, would have the chance to determine if that's what they really wanted. That's sort of how I'm looking at this at a, at a meta level. So what caught my attention was your response to the Chief Justice um, when you suggested that your client couldn't withdraw from the state of Texas because you read the provision related to censorship and geography as ensuring that you don't do so. I had not read that provision in that way. So can you say more about why that's your interpretation? Sure. I think that's the obvious interpretation of that provision, particularly when it talks about, you know, this, is, this isn't like, you know, don't, don't discriminate against Texans or Texans wherever they are. The fact that it's particularly preventing us from discriminating on somebody with a geographic location in Texas is basically telling us that we can't try to geofence our service and try to essentially, you know, ex explain to the people, you know, sometimes like if you get like uh, your cable service has a dispute with the provider and you can't get your football game and they tell you if you're hacked off about this, you know, call this number and complain. We can't do that in response to this law. And I think the legislators in Texas were able to tell their constituents, um, don't worry, um, you know, if you like your website, you can keep it. Um, we're not going to threaten. They can't, they can't pull out of here based on uh, the way that we're regulating them. So even if we could read it a different way, you're saying that this necessarily, I mean, I guess this also dovetails with my concern about us not having sort of state interpretations or an application here to really understand. Because I could read this differently. It seems to me it's fitting into the whole set of things you're not allowed to do. You can't censor people on the basis of the viewpoint um, uh, of the user. You can't uh, censor them basis on, on the basis of the viewpoint that is being expressed. And you can't censor them based on their location um, in your state or another part of the state. And so I guess I don't necessarily see that in the same way. I mean, you can't just automatically do that, I guess. I don't know. It, 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 it seems to me quite clear that it's designed essentially as a poison pill, or somebody described it as the Hotel California provision, that you, can, you, can, you, can, you can't nice. leave Texas uh, even if you want to uh, try to do that as a way of showing that this is an impermissible way of regulating our expressive activities. And, you know, so, so I, I, I do think that is the right reading. I do think the fact that it's geo, geo, geographical location in Texas is kind of a clue to that. So this is not something where, you know, if you're a 
you know, if you're a Texas fan, you're protected no matter where you go in America. This really is designed to sort of say that you can't do the kind of geofencing that you might otherwise do to comply with an idiosyncratic state law. I should mention, just for the sake of completeness, that, you know, in the lower courts, not part of the preliminary injunction, there are dormant Commerce Clause challenges to these provisions and the way that this is just kind of one state trying to regulate everybody. And so that's part of the case that will be there. But it's not here yet. But it's not here. All that's All right. here is a preliminary injunction that runs to my clients. So, I mean, you know, this, this statute has a smaller universe of people, but if there's somebody else out there uh, who, you know, isn't one of my clients, who isn't covered by this preliminary injunction, the statute could take effect as to those people, and the same is true in Florida. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. General Preliger. Mr. Chief Justice. I mean, it's a great argument, and the, the concerns are notable, and trying to figure out exactly what this thing is and how it behaves is, is a lot of the game in this thing, because that's sort of what I said at the start. Like, what is, what is a YouTube? What is a Twitter? What is a Facebook? What is an Instagram? What is a TikTok, for that matter? Although TikTok is perhaps not a great example, because that's also being regulated by federal law differently, but I digress. It's like, what are these things? Are they the telegraph? Are they the telephone? Are they a newspaper? Are they a bookstore? Are they a newsstand? It's like, what are these things? As we're trying to figure out how to regulate and how to go, to, how to go about this thing. And it's a long way. And can the states categorize this as a matter of state law? And the, the, the answer seems to be yes, uh, if, if they're merely a conduit for communication. Because if they're merely a conduit, we're not, we're not talking First Amendment. We're talking conduct, right? I might be delivering speech, but I'm delivering. That's the thing, because I'm a conduit. I'm the messenger. You know, I'm not speaking. I'm delivering. The message is the speech. The message is the speaker. But I'm not the speaker. I'm just delivering. I'm just doing conduct. So if I come to you as the state, if I'm the state of Florida or the state of Texas, or if we're going back into the telegraph and where some of this precedent deals with, if I'm the state of New York, as was the case at one time, and I'm like, hey, Western Union, you must send the messages because that's what you do. You send messages. You, you transmit the message. Someone comes to you and they pay you a fee and you send the message. You transmit the message. So you're not speaking. You're just, you're just acting. You're just, you're just acting to, to send messages. That's all you're doing. And you're not regulated as a matter of federal law, at least at this time in this way. So we're the state of New York and we're going to make you. And that is a completely different thing because you don't have a federal constitutional guarantee. So this is basically the state saying you can't exclude the person who comes in your door. So states have the right to exclude unless they, you know, don't. Or businesses have the right to exclude unless they don't. Because businesses are regulated by their individual states. And so, you know, obviously you can't discriminate on the basis of protected characteristics. But then again, those protected characteristics are a feature of law. Why can't you refuse the black person who comes in the door? It's like you have the right to do business. Well, yes, you do. But you must. You must take the black person who comes in the door. You must take the, the Protestant who comes in the door. You have to accept that coffee order. You have to accept that order. You must serve them, business person. And the, the state wishes to impose further burdens. It's like you want to do you want to do business in our state. It's like you must serve you must we can tell you who you must serve as one of the conditions of our state law. And that makes sense for a lot of reasons. Corporations, of course, are a matter of law. Corporate the corporate form is a matter of law. But for the states creating the corporate form, the corporate form doesn't exist in the first place. So the fact that you can exist as a corporation at all is by the grace of the state. <laughs> so the state can the state can impose on you and make you do things. Your very existence is at is at, is at our pleasure. So yeah, it's like well, so what kind of thing is this? And the only sort of counter consideration, of course, comes if it's your speech. If you if it is your speech, if it's your First Amendment, well, now suddenly we have a we have a different law. That comes into place, right? Now the state is like, the state of Texas is all over here like, you know, you have to do this. And the federal government's like, no, 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 you can't do that because First Amendment. But of course, whose First Amendment? 
whose First Amendment is critical? Who is the speaker? Who is speaking? Who Freedom of speech applies to the speaker. Who's speaking? And that that becomes the interesting thing. So Paul Clement, great argument. He's definitely on his A game here today for what we can say about other arguments he's had recently. Paul Clement's on his A game today trying to walk this tightrope. And he does have Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to help him. Of course, it doesn't particularly help that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act was passed in 1996 when the internet was a little bit different than it is today. The 1996 internet and the 2024 internet are a bit different. The, the, the social media things we're talking about were not even a dream in anyone's eye in 1996. So we are trying to read a 30 year, law, year, year old law onto the internet, which, you know, I, I, which is marginally better than trying to read a 400 year old law onto the internet, because sometimes that happens too. But you know, that's where we're at. All right, great. So he did a fine job trying to walk the line. He talks about how this is just overly expansive, over, overly burdensome, problematic in practice. And the justices fight with him a little bit on the pragmatic implications of this or not. And he fights back in a really interesting way. And he's like, well, you know, we kind of we kind of can have our cake and eat it too, because 230 says we can. So it can be both not our speech and our speech, maybe at the same time. Or at least it's our platform and, and we're and we're providing speech. So there's something there. So he's walking his tightrope very well and did a great job. All right. We're next going to hear from the Solicitor General of the United States, Ms. Preligar, who kicks ass. Ms. Preligar has definitely been warming her way into my heart. She is both a beauty and a brilliant, which is just unfair. No one should have this much natural talent. But she is both extremely beautiful and extremely smart. So... That's just unfair, but it's true. And she has been recently kicking so much ass. And it's been truly wonderful to watch that she's just really, really good at her job. So she definitely has the potential to reach the pantheon. She's on she's on her she's on trajectory to reach the pantheon of the greats, where the person we just listened to, Mr. Clement, is in the pa pantheon of the greats. And she's definitely, you know, knocking at that door. So let's see if she can uh, continue her rise onto the Mount Olympus. Let's continue by listening to what the Solicitor General has to say on the issue. And may it please the court. I want to pick up with the question that Justice Alito asked in the seriatim round to my friend about the idea that the social media platforms don't perfectly fit into either analogy or paradigm here. And I want to acknowledge the force of that intuition. They obviously operate at a massive scale that goes beyond any particular parade or beyond any particular newspaper. I think the right thing to do with that intuition is to recognize that it's not like you can just exempt them from the First Amendment. Uh, they are obviously creating something that's inherently expressive and taking all of this quantity of speech on their websites and curating it and making selectivity decisions and compiling it into a product that users are going to consume. So the First Amendment applies, but I think that those kinds of concerns about how the social media platforms and how they look somewhat different from the other kinds of expressive products this Court has reviewed in prior cases can come into the question of whether the First <coughs> Amendment is satisfied with respect to any particular regulation. Now, here, we think it's not satisfied because of the way that Texas has designed this law. I'd urge the court to rule narrowly. It's not necessary here to try to figure out uh, how the First Amendment applies to new technology in general or to every possible website or the Internet in particular. This law has a very clear defect. What Texas has done is try to countermand the protected editorial speech decisions of the platform, and the only justification it's offered to the courts below is that it wanted to essentially amplify amplify the voice of users on that platform by suppressing the platform's own protected speech. That is a defect that is clear under the First Amendment, and the court could say only that and resolve this case. I welcome the court's questions. Uh, General, the, um, when I asked you about the differential, the difference in treatment of private party as opposed to the government engaged in similar conduct, uh, your answer was, of course, that it, it would be different. The government would be bound uh, to uh, comply with the First Amendment. What, uh, there was some discussion in a number of the amicus briefs uh, about uh, instances in which the government and the private party 
uh, say, petitioners or petitioners here, uh, and the government coordinating efforts. Uh, how do you respond to that? So let me respond to that by saying I think the position we're offering here and the position this court will consider next month in the Murthy case are entirely consistent. We, of course, acknowledge that if the government actually coerces the platforms and takes over their editorial decision making, then the platforms could be deemed a state actor and that would be subject to First Amendment scrutiny. We vigorously dispute that that has actually happened and the federal government has engaged in that kind of coercive conduct and we further dispute the legal standards that were applied in that case. But there's no inherent tension here. You know, the federal government obviously can act and criticize the social media platform's content moderation decisions. That's just using the bully pulpit to express views. And if, if the states disagreed with how the platforms were exercising their content moderation standards, it could have done the same. It could have criticized them. It could have urged them or tried to influence them to adopt separate standards. But here, what the state did is said, we're going to pass a law that actually takes over their content moderation and dictates that it has to be done in a different way. General, um, uh, Texas's law, even more than Florida's, can be understood as um, an expansion of public accommodations laws. And the United States is uh, often in a position of defending public accommodations laws and uh, insisting that they be uh, vigorously enforced. And how do you see what Texas is trying to do as consistent with that broader stance about public accommodations laws? Yes. So I want to be very clear and stake out potentially some separate ground from my friend representing the platforms in this case with respect to generally applicable public accommodations laws that protect based on a, a, a particular status. We think, of course, those laws are valid on their face and that they serve compelling governmental interests. Uh, and so to the extent that you're looking at how an ordinary public accommodations law operates, the refusal to deal, the refusal to serve, as Justice Barrett said, we think that's a regulation of conduct and that ordinarily there would be no First Amendment problem with the application of that law. Now, I acknowledge that it gets more complicated when those laws are applied to a business that is providing an expressive product and cases like Hurley or 303 Creative show that in certain applications, sometimes the public accommodations law has to give way to First Amendment interests. But I I think the, the court has drawn a clear line. It has never suggested that the mere refusal to deal or serve based on status, even with respect to an expressive association, would fail under First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, instead, you know, you look at a case like 303 Creative, and there the concern was about changing the message. Or a case like Hurley, gay and lesbian individuals could march. You just couldn't change the message by holding up a particular sign. So we recognize that there are going to be some applications where you'd have to conduct that kind of First Amendment analysis. But if the question, the relevant the question is, could you just bar people on the basis of a protected status from creating an account? And it's not going to affect your message. They want to, you know, lurk on X and read other people's posts. I think that that kind of law would certainly be valid. I want to briefly address, Justice Gorsuch, the question you asked about the scope of CDA pre I have to give her credit for using the word lurk. I don't know if she intended that with the precision in which she delivered it, but... Lurk was exactly the correct word, so bonus points. Under Section 230, just to be clear on this one, I, I want to say there are unresolved issues here. I would warn the court away from trying to resolve exactly how much conduct CDA 230 protects and exactly how that interacts with the Texas law here. The only point I would make is that you know, there, are, there are questions about what it means to act in good faith, questions about what it means for the platform to take down content that, uh, that is otherwise objectionable, but however those interpretive disputes might shake out in a particular case, surely Texas here isn't saying that its entire law is preempted and it has no effect whatsoever, and CDA 230 fully takes care of the problem. So I think what the court could do, not knowing exactly the scope of how that preemption issue might be resolved, is to say whatever exists in that category of speech that Texas is prohibiting, the editorial decisions it's countermanding on the one hand versus what CDA 230 would authorize on the other hand, whether that's a big category or a little category, all of the things in that category constitute protected decisions by the platform that haven't been adequately justified and i think that's all you need to say about the preemption issue in this damn girl damn girl that's 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 a good answer uh, i i i really that's a really good answer man uh separate out the separate separate the guy the line man she she talks about the case law she talks about so she talks about the prior case law 
about the dealing with the line, some applications where you have to conduct the First Amendment analysis, and the relevant question, could you just bar people on the basis of protected status from creating an account? So she seems to say, well, if Texas wants to pass that law, that's cool. So she's not giving up very much, right? So if you want to just merely create an account, I, I suppose you can, uh, but you might not be able to send it. Or, but if you just want to use it to lurk at other people's accounts, maybe Texas can be, maybe Texas can require Twitter for you to have an account, even if it doesn't allow you to do anything. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, except, you know, just receive traffic, uh, as opposed to send traffic. And then she she jumps on to, George's, to Gorsuch's question about 230, and she wants the court to try to stay away from the 230 question for a lot of reasons, because the Supreme Court has never really spoken about 230, like ever. The lower courts have to a lot of degree, a large degree, but the Supreme Court has never had. And so she is justifiably frightened about the Supreme Court speaking about the question because, well, you know, if the Supreme Court speaks, the Supreme Court speaks. And she would really prefer them not doing that right now uh, if they don't have to, which I, I endlessly appreciate. You know, you don't want the Supreme Court to rule on things you don't have to. So it's like, you know, this is a completely undeveloped area of law. You know, for the Supreme Court, really prefer that you not answer any questions right there, right now. So that's good. And, you know, she says, when she talks about good faith, right, because this is this idea about what good faith means and what otherwise objectionable means. These are the issues in the CDA 230. Because it says, basically, I'm, I'm not, can't, I can't quote, can't, can't quote it verbatim, but if a social media company uh, editorializes, removes, deletes content in good faith for because the content is obscene, blah, 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 or otherwise objectionable, right? So we have these two potential things. What does it mean to do something in good faith? What does it mean to be otherwise objectionable? The lower courts have said this means whatever the social media companies want to mean, basically. So everything is good faith, er, at least according to the lower courts, everything is good faith and everything is otherwise objectionable. That seems to be what they say. So she's like about what, you know, there are questions about what it means to act in good faith, questions about otherwise objectionable, fair enough, because the Supreme Court's never answered those questions. That's sort of the lingering monster in the background we'd really prefer you not to answer right now. Um, but however that might shake out in some case that might actually deal with those things in some future day, um, Texas isn't of course saying they preempted so whatsoever and 230 fully taking care. So what I think the court could do, not knowing the exact scope of how the preemption issue might be resolved. So how does 230, how does 230 limit Texas? Because if the federal government is preempted Texas, it's preempted Texas. So, you know, without knowing whether or not preemption exists or not, so maybe I don't even have to answer that question. Because if I don't answer 230, if I don't talk about 230, I don't have to talk about whether 230 is preempting or not, right? If I don't, if I don't have to even talk about 230, then I surely don't have to decide whether it's preempting or not in some application. So, you know, so instead of doing all those things, she says, you could say whatever exists in a category of speech that Texas is prohibiting, the editorial decisions is countermanding on the one hand versus what 230 would authorize, whether that's bigger or little or category, all those things can constitute protected decisions by the platform. And she just basically roots everything back into the First Amendment analysis. So she just like, forget 230, forget 230, forget otherwise objectionable, forget, you know, all that stuff. And just be like, you know, if, if Texas is prohibiting editorial decisions, then that's a First Amendment problem. That's all you need to decide. And so she basically, you know, dodges every, she dodges every laser beam. She dodges every landmine and tells the Supreme Court not to look at the man behind the curtain and only focus on this thing over here, and she is absolutely slaying it. She's slaying it. Case. If a legislative body enacts a law requiring viewpoint neutrality in some area, and it does so because it has, it is concerned that people who express a particular viewpoint are suffering discrimination. Uh, is that law unconstitutional on the ground that the intent of the legislative body uh, was to benefit a particular group? 
No, I don't think that that kind of law would immediately be unconstitutional. And again, I think if it's structured like a generally applicable public accommodations law, there might be important or significant governmental interests in being able to protect against that kind of discrimination. Unless there are any further questions? Can I do one more? Sure. Um, government has spent a lot of time defending net neutrality, so maybe I should have asked you this um, with respect to Florida's law, just given the breadth of that law, and why are Internet service providers, in your view, so different, and what if an Internet service provider wanted to make certain content distinctions? Internet service providers are fundamentally different because they are engaged in transmitting data in order to make websites accessible, and that is not inherently expressive. They're certainly providing the, the infrastructure, the cable, the fiber optics, and the service to make sure that you can log in on your home computer and access the Internet writ large. But along the way, they're not compiling that speech into any kind of expressive compilation of their own. So we would put them in the same category as telephone and telegraph companies or UPS, where you could say, sure, they're literally facilitating the transmission of speech, but they're not creating a, an expressive product that could implicate the First Amendment principles at stake. Now, then you might ask, okay, well, what if they want to start discriminating with respect to the service they're providing for particular types of websites? The kind of quintessential example of this is an Internet service provider that decides to slow down service to a streaming site, let's say Netflix, because it wants to direct Internet traffic to some other website of its own choosing, maybe its own streaming service. We think net neutrality could come in there and, and say you're not allowed to discriminate based on content in that way. But that's because, again, there would be no expressive uh, speech or or, or compilation that you could attribute to the Internet service provider itself. People don't sign up with Comcast or Verizon to give them some kind of limited, curated access to the Internet. They're engaging in service with those companies because they need someone physically to transmit the data so they can get access to the whole Internet. Can I ask one? I don't have to buy anything you just said to rule for your position in this case, or anything you just said on net neutrality, right? You do not have to agree with me, Justice Kavanaugh. I hope someday, if it comes to it, to persuade you. But, I'm not, I'm not but, saying, but I just want to make sure that's walled nothing off. Nothing yeah. about the yeah. court's decision yeah. in this case would at all affect the net neutrality issue. You know, we think that here the platforms are engaging in expressive activity. That's protected by the First Amendment, and you can leave for another She's smart. She's beautiful. She's funny. She can turn a joke. Is it is it is it is it too late to elect her queen? I mean, you know, yeah, she's she's so smart. Day, all of the kind of conduit questions that come up in the net neutrality context. Thank you, thank you, counsel, Mr. Nielsen. All right, Justice. Uh, all right, uh, Attorney General. Apologize, not Attorney General. Solicitor General Prelogar uh, continues to crush it and prove us to all be unworthy at her feet. Uh, you know, she she is practicing law, and the rest of the rest of us are just pretending. Um, she is she is so good. She is so controlled. She's just so good at staying in frame. It's it's amazing, and she's disarming, intelligent, informed. She knows her history. She knows cross application. She knows, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of practice in this to be sure, but I'm not that good. I'm just, I'm just not that good. You know, all the, all the prep in the world, I, I can't, I can't do this. Um, she's just better than me. And, uh, yeah. So it's humbling. She kicks ass. So, uh, Paul Clement was great. Paul, uh, uh, Lugar continues to show herself to be the new, new Clement. Even Clement must probably bow to her at some point in the near future. Holy shit. Let's see if Aaron Nielsen can round up this party by being just as good as our prior two. That's, 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 a, tough, that's a tough one if you're Aaron Nielsen over here. Aaron Nielsen has to go after Paul Clement and Solicitor General Prelegar and got to perform at that level. Holy shit, dude. Holy shit. Uh, that's, 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 that's rough, man. That's rough. I'm so sorry for you. Let's see if, let's see if Aaron over here can, uh, can hold his own. Good luck, Aaron. Uh, thank you. It's been a long day. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. This is not the first time that new technology has been used to stifle speech. 
telegraphs also discriminated based on viewpoint, prompting a national, a national scandal. Yet under the platform's theory, Western Union was just making editorial choices not to transmit pro-union views. Today, millions of Americans don't visit friends or family or even go to work online. Uh, on person, everybody is on. Yeah, two truths for liberty says you'd have her pairs of sisters in my court. I, I know that. I know that. I'm trying to factor all that in. I'm trying to factor all that in. I'm like, can I do this? Can I do this with all the prep in the world? Can I do this with all the preparation in the world? Can I, can I play at her level? I can certainly not embarrass myself. I can certainly be an also ran. I might even be good. But can I play the way that she can play? I'm like, no. No. I, I, I can't. I, no. <laughs> no. No. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm like a 7 out of 10 on my best day. And she's like 9.9 .9 out of 10. Yeah, she's she now that of course doesn't mean that she's right and it doesn't even necessarily mean that I wouldn't win. You know, if because if I have the better legal if I have the better legal she but she's just so much better, right? So the attorney the attorney makes the presentation as good as it can be. But if I have the better legal theory, I have the better legal theory, but she's gonna blow me away in performance. And if I if I win, if I win, it's probably in spite of myself to some degree. I'm humble. I know my limitations. Online, the modern public square. Yet if platforms that passively host the speech of billions of people are themselves the speakers and can discriminate, there will be no public square to speak of. We know this because Twitter has admitted that their theory of the First Amendment would allow them to discriminate, not just based on what is said on the platform, but, quote, on the basis of religion or gender or physical disability. That's not the First Amendment. That's Lochner 2.0. As more than 40 states warn the court, the implications are gravely serious. On the other hand, I'd be better than this guy. Ugh. For example, as New York explains, if these algorithms are constitutionally protected, platforms may be able to continue selling advertisers the ability to, um, to discriminate based on race. Or, as Professor Lawrence Lessig, Zephyr Teachout, and Tim Wu, who do not typically file briefs in support of Texas, um, <laughs> caution not just states, but Congress may be powerless to address the social media crisis devastating the lives of kids. HB 20 is a modest effort to regulate such power in the context of viewpoint discrimination. Platforms can say anything they want under HB 20, about anything. There's no limit. They can say anything they want. Users can block anything they don't want. There's no limit on that. All that's left is voluntary communications between people who want to speak and people who want to listen. This law is thus nowhere near the heartland of the First Amendment. Uh, instead, this is democracy and federalism, not a facial pre-enforcement injunction. I welcome the court's questions. Uh, if you, if uh, this was so uh, clearly within uh, a common law tradition, as you suggest, why hasn't Congress uh, seen fit to uh, uh, to act as Texas has, and uh, it appears that uh, Mr. Clement suggests that actually Congress uh, has acted in the opposite direction. Would you comment on that? Yeah, I don't see how, uh, with all respect to my friend, how their reading of 230 is at all consistent with what Congress said. They have all sorts of kind of policy arguments about how 230 ought to work, but if you actually just read the words of the statute, it doesn't work. So his suggestion that Congress somehow has kicked out Texas or said that that's not how he wants to be, I don't think is consistent with the text of the statute. I didn't hear a lot of textual argument um, coming from Mr. Clement there. So that'd be my, my first line answer. My second line answer is I have no idea why Congress does or does not do, uh, but I do know that Texas has the ability to protect Texans, and that's what Texas has done here. Counsel, you began by saying, you know, the uh, platforms, they want to keep out this person and that person on the basis of uh, race or sex. And then you said, that's not the First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment doesn't apply to them. The First Amendment restricts what the government can do. And what the government's doing here is saying, you must do this. You must carry these people. You've got to explain if you don't. That's not the First Amendment. Well, respectfully, Your Honor, the First Amendment is big. and It applies in a lot of different ways. So... 
it's true um, for us, like we're saying, because this isn't speech, it's conduct, we can require viewpoint neutrality. But in other cases, the same companies are saying when New York or some other state says, hey, you can't have algorithms that try to hook kids, they say, well, we have a First Amendment right to do that. It's the same First Amendment, the same First Amendment that says, uh, I mean, if it's all First Amendment, then I guess it's going to be hard for Texas to say you, you have to be viewpoint neutral, but it's also going to be hard for California and Illinois or anybody else to say you can't have an algorithm um, that hooks kids, because it's all the yeah, same. I'm First sure Amendment. it's the same for all the other all the other states. The question is, they don't have the obligation to uh, uh, act in the same way that you as the state has the obligation to do. They can discriminate against particular uh, groups that they don't like, um, uh, whether it's a group that encourages kids to uh, take uh, the Tide Pod camp, uh, contest or, or something else. Uh, and uh, you have different obligations. I guess a couple of ways I could respond to that, Your Honor. The easiest one I'm going to talk about is, if I may, um, common carriage. Um, my reaction coming to this case was the same as yours. My reaction was, well, wait a minute. It's their own platform. You can't censor. Like, they're, they're private. But that's the exact same scenario that came up with the Telegraph. Um, the idea that Telegraph was dumb pipes is not true. Instead, what the Telegraph was is they had the technological, technological ability to say that we're not going to let this type of speech through. No, you're absolutely um, right, but it's kind of begging the question. You're assuming that they're like the Telegraph. It seems to me that that's a big part of what the case uh, case concerns. And I'm just not sure that, I mean, the Telegraph had particular compelling type of uh, monopoly. I mean, if you didn't want to use the telegraph that was there, you usually didn't have an alternative choice, or whether you're talking about railroads or other types of common carriers. Uh, I'm not sure the same thing applies um, uh, with respect to social platforms. So can I give you my theory for why common carriage is important here? Uh, as I look at the cases, and I agree, they're really hard to figure out where conduct starts and speech ends and all of that. And you look at all of the various cases this court has said, some commentators say they can't be reconciled. I'm not sure about that. Um, but I think it's a helpful way to think about it is we know that there is a line between speech and conduct. Uh, and we know that common carriage has always been on the non-speech side of the line, the conduct side of the line. So if this falls within the common law tradition of what is common carriage, nobody has ever thought that falls on the speech side of the line. So we, have, we can't make them you know, say something that otherwise that they, that they didn't want to say. The whole point of it is that's a signal to the court. That's a way that the court can figure out which side of the line are we on. Well, that, that's that it turns on whether you're saying who do you want to leave uh, the judgment about who can speak or who can't speak on these platforms, and do you want to leave it with the government, with the state, or do you want to leave it with the platforms, the different various platforms? Well, the First Amendment has a thumb on the scale when that question is asked. It does, and that's why it's important, I said, to go back to look at the history of this, because at some point the First Amendment has to end, or everything is covered by the First Amendment. This Court has said uh, that the way that we tell the difference is whether it's inherently expressive, um, and the Court has said what they mean by inherently expressive. Uh, they talked about in, you know, Miami Herald, you're not a passive conduit. Um, we talked about in Hurley whether you're intimately connected. Well, this court last year had a case in Tamna where they talked about what these platforms do, and they say that they are passively connected um, to the speech on their platforms, and that they're agnostic about the content. It's just one big algorithm that's matching things together. Uh, and I think that that's important. But I also want to stress, if I may, again, this is a facial posture, and if you look at the breadth of our statute, uh, there's the talk about, you know, whether you have to host somebody's speech. There's also also about you just want to read Facebook. Um, that is one of the provisions of our statute. You go online in the morning and you want to see what's going on in the world. Uh, according to their theory, they can stop you from doing that, too. And that's surely public accommodation law. Um, the idea that somebody, they don't like somebody because of their race or their disability or something like that, and we're going to say we're not going to allow you onto our platform, that surely cannot be constitutional. That's what I mean by that's Lochner. That's you've gone beyond any content of the <laughs> platforms themselves on their page. Lochner, by the way, refers to a case and more broadly an era 
of the U.S. Supreme Court and basically where contract primacy was a huge thing. Um, they basically said freedom to contract was really, really huge in Lochner, the case, and also Lochner, the era, because it defined a 20-year era of U.S. Supreme Court thinking in the early 20th century and has been widely mocked and discredited since then. I think it has some merit, but it is definitely a wayward theory. And mentioning Lochner, it's like, ugh, it's like, ugh just like eh, it's like eh, it's eh, I don't know. to saying we're not going to let people even look at what we're selling that's a bookstore saying we won't sell you our book that's different from saying we won't publish your book do you think so, that there are any unconstitutional applications of your law i mean that's a hard question um i i suspect that there might be what would they look um, like so the one that um comes to mind would be Imagine, and, and this comes up in, in their brief, they pick like the most vile example, and they say, imagine a publisher didn't want to publish the book written by the Proud Boys, was the example that they use. I think you might very well have an eyes applied challenge to that. But the problem for them is they pick the most vile example when I think all of it would say, well, wait a minute, you, surely you can let them on Facebook and you can't kick them off because their grandma said something outrageous, right? So there's got to be a limit there. And that's why a facial resolution of this case doesn't work. And if it is, And how do you separate the one from the other? Where's the line? Isn't, that's hard, right? Um, I would say it's this hard. court struggled with that um, in 303 uh. Creative um, because it's really hard to know when something becomes inherently expressive. And the court's cases like Dale about when is something that happened, all of those are hard cases. But in all of them, this court has had facts. They've actually looked at the facts of the case and tried to figure out, as, as applied, whether that makes sense here. In this situation, there's a million applications of this law that are perfectly fine. Um, and they pick some of the most vile possible hypotheticals, ignoring, by the way, the provision of Texas law, which they never address, which says under Texas law, if you don't want to hear content, they're allowed to make sure you never hear that content. Um, so all you have left, I mean, again, they never mention at all. That's like focus point of our brief. They never respond to it. Uh, Jix Clements says the amendments are limited. Sure. I mean, they're limited by their own terms, naturally. And the concepts that they uh, cover are limited. Yes. To say an amendment, yes, if the, amendment, uh, the amendments are limited. But that's naturally true because they can't cover everything. So, but yeah, um, I don't like this guy. I, this guy bores me. I, I am not engaged. Maybe it's his vocal tone, but all I'm hearing is wah 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 wah. After hearing the singing of the singing of Clement and Prelegar, his voice are like nails in my ears. I, I think I passed out at some point. Uh, we'll press on though. But that means uh, all that's left is. I don't want to hear this type of speech. I just want to hear this type of speech. And it's just volu voluntary communication. That's a telephone. Um, Mr. Nielsen, um, we, you heard during the prior argument a lot of conversation about how broad Florida's law was. I read Texas's law to be more narrow in its coverage, that it wouldn't sweep in some of the examples we were using in the last argument, like Uber, Etsy. Is that, am I correct? I think that's fair, Your Honor. So what platforms does Texas's law cover? Am I right that it covers only the classic social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook? So that's what their deponent has said. Um, the only one that they were th sure that it was covered um, is Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. But that's their deponent. Presumably Texas is the one who can authority. If it was in the Texas yeah. courts, I mean, yeah. it's not them. Okay, you know, it's guys like Aaron that make me feel like I have hope at the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, it makes me feel better, you know, in my life that, you know, it's okay that maybe I can't, you know, glide effortlessly on the, on the ice, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's okay. <laughs> like Paul Clement and Prelegar, although 
being up against Prey Lagar and Clement would certainly make me try harder. So there's that, but I'd probably get my ass handed to me, but that's okay. But people like uh, Nielsen over here are making me feel better. It's like, you know, I, I, I can do this. I, I, I feel like I can do this. I don't feel like it's a lack of humility. I don't feel like it's pompous arrogance. I feel like, you know, with enough practice and prep and thought, I, I think I can uh, play at uh, Nielsen's level. I, I think I can, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> Oh, man. They're not the ones that get to decide authoritatively what the scoop, sca scope of the law is. Well, correct. I mean, we would have to prove it at trial that well, they're What's Texas's to position it. about the scope of the law? Well, the law says that it applies to any platform with more than 50 million active users per month. Um, so I'm not sure where some of the other platforms fall on that. The ones that, like I said, that we know are, are the three biggest ones fall. So you're, you're making that judgment based on size. So it's nothing about the definition. I mean, in the last argument, we were pointing out that the Florida law in defining what a platform does and how mm -hmm. it works would encompass Uber, for example. But, oh, oh, oh. but you're saying that you're, you're just distinguishing this based on numbers. Uh, no, I apologize, Your Honor. There's also a separate provision which defines social media platform as a website open to the public, allowing the user to create an account, and enables users to communicate with other users for the primary purpose of posting information, comments, and so on. And so is it Texas's position that that definition then covers the classic social media sites, and by classic social, social media sites, I mean sites like Facebook and YouTube? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and that it would not sweep more broadly to some of these other things like Etsy? I don't think so, Your Honor. Um, but the, the district court but, thought it covered WhatsApp. Do you think that it doesn't? I don't know. The, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer. That's the answer. Really? You don't know the answer? The district court said it, though. The district court said it. How do you not have an opinion on this? Right? I mean... This isn't something you're hearing for the first time ever, right? It isn't just one of the justices said, hey, how about WhatsApp? And you say, you know, Your Honor, no one's ever mentioned WhatsApp before, ever before in this case, so I haven't really thought about it. Thank you for your question. No, the question was, hey, the district court, remember them? Yeah, they said that this covers what app? WhatsApp. What do you think? I don't know. Really? You don't know? Seriously? You don't know? You're not You're not doing the state of Texas any favors, my friend. You, you don't know. Okay, is WhatsApp in the box or not in the box? You knew about this. You've had some time to think about it. I have no clue. Great. That's that's super helpful. Mr. Nielsen over here is not playing at the Paul Clement Pray Ligar level. That's the best I can give you. I don't know. We don't have discovery into that. We had the deponent, their own witness said, these are the three that we are sure are covered. It might very well be. That's another reason why it's hard to do this on a facial basis, because uh, it might very well be WhatsApp, which sure looks like a telephone to me, um, it would be covered by. But what about, I mean, it's within the big three, there are. Is the state of is the state of Texas not have good solicitors? I mean, I'm available. I'm I'm just saying, I'm in Texas and everything. I'm licensed. I'll go to the Supreme Court. I'm I can do this. The state of Texas run out of people? Damn some email looking functions aren't there i mean I, I appreciate that it's hard to do this because we don't have a record but i understood that face at facebook for example which you say would be covered has a messenger function yes Your Honor. which looks like email so wouldn't we have to do this at the level of the functionality of these various platforms rather than at the kind of entity level yes your honor i you would um and it's not just that you'd also have to go through the d different types of verbs included in our statute for censoring, including the one that they keep ignoring, which is the ability to receive the expression of somebody else. That's when I say you look at the text of the statute, their theory would mean that even if you just want to lurk and just listen and see what other people are saying, they can kick you off for any reason at all. So if you have somebody who had never posted anything or their speech is identical to the speech of somebody else, their theory is, well, we can kick you off. 
that seems to me pretty far into the world of public accommodations. Like, you know, 303 was a narrow case. If that's what 303 means, like, boy, now we're really, really, really big. You know, hence Digital Locker or Locker 2.0, the idea. Don't, don't mention Lochner. Just. Uh. Yeah, that everything can't be protected by the First Amendment. At some point, there's lines of, that, of content. Counsel, um, <laughs> yeah, during the prior argument, which I'm sure you listened to attentively. Yes, uh, Your Honor. <laughs> Lochner was a hundred years ago. <laughs> no, let it go. No one wants to talk about Lochner. Uh, there, there was some discussion about how uh, difficult life will be if these injunctions are dissolved and um, a parade of horribles and expenses and, and difficulty geofencing uh, Texas or Florida. Can you address some of those concerns? Neil Gorsuch trying to show some mercy by giving this guy a softball. Hey, there were some of these concerns. Can you talk about any of that for a while? Neil over here trying to trying to do a mercy. Okay, Neil, let's see if you can figure out how to convert this, Neil. He just softballed you. I know you can do it. Yes, uh, two answers, if I may. First, there is some suggestion that the prohibition on discrimination against Texas or a part of Texas is somehow a trap to keep key companies in. That's not true. Um, you read the statute, that's not what it says. There's a separate provision in the statute, which is the jurisdictional hook, um, which is, you know, if you're doing business in Texas. And by the way, even if Texas tried to do that, there's something called personal jurisdiction uh, uh, that you can simply just leave a forum. That's this court's decision in Ford. So th that argument is just not true. But the other part I think is really important about this is Texas's law, what is the remedy here? It's an injunction. Uh, there's no damages here. It's an injunction. And in fact, we know that it's not going to flood the courts because the injunction against the attorney general is limited to um, the attorney general. There's private enforcement of Section 7. And we have a handful of cases because you don't get damages. So it's hard unless you have a really darn good case to be able to go to court if nobody's going to get damages for prevailing. Um, which I think matters a lot in terms of, like, what are the real-world consequences here? They're going to have some lawsuits by the Attorney General for injunctions. And if we can't prove it, if we can't prove viewpoint discrimination, they will prevail. Did you say they could stop doing business in Texas under this law? Yes, Your Honor. Of course. Um, I mean, it's, it's true under the law, but it's also just true as a matter of personal jurisdiction. Anybody can get out of any jurisdiction. I just meant under the law. Correct. Yes, under the law, yes, Your Honor. How does that, how does that work if you're talking about Facebook? I mean, if somebody were emailed and all that, if they send something into Texas, are they doing business in Texas? Uh, no, Your Honor, though that would be a fun personal jurisdiction case. Uh, the answer, as I understand it, is you have to purposely avail yourself of the forum. So merely because somebody can look at your website, if you're not having some purposeful direction towards the forum, that's generally not sufficient. No, no, these, it's a worldwide sort of thing, and people are going to be sending stuff left and right, and you know that uh, as, as, the, as the company. I'm not sure. I don't see how they can wall off Texas from the activities of the social media platform? Well, I mean, two answers. One, they can. They have the technological ability. It's called geofencing, which they can carve off. I, think, I mean, if they wanted to, they could probably carve off this building itself. They have the ability all the way down to that granular level. Um, but, but again, more than that, it isn't just the, it shows up there. If you want to have a, an account with Facebook or Twitter or any others, like there's a contractual relationship between the two. So they have customers that are in these places places. And people say, well, they don't have any customers because they're not charging any money. Well, we know that if they're not charging any money, like, you're, the, you're the product. Um, so they're taking your data and they're selling it to the average. Did they, did they find this guy on Reddit? Is, is, are, we, are we hiring lawyers from a Reddit forum? Ugh. Advertisers, which is why it's so important that we recognize that if this algorithm is protected by the Constitution, then they can take that data 
and sell it to people and have highly targeted ads based on socioeconomic characteristics. The New York brief explains that on page 12, which I think is important and doesn't, shouldn't get lost in this. Uh, they pick, again, the most vile examples, which are the fanciful things that we don't usually do in a facial posture, and they try to say, well, that means the whole law should fail. There's a whole lot of perfectly fine applications that the court needs to remember and not lose sight of. What, what about uh, terrorist speech? How's that handled? Yeah, um, so uh, a few ways. Um, the first response that I would have to that is the provision of the statute that they ignore, which is no user has to receive anything they don't want. Right. That still allows the sure, communication okay. of it, so that's All not— right. Well, let's, let's go through that there. So now, now we're, now we're most of the universe is gone, but the next level of this, under Texas law, if it's illegal— they don't have to do that either. So I'm assuming that a lot of the terrorism is going to be, you know, like we're inciting you to come join Hamas or something like that. No, and no, no, no. Just the pro-Al-Qaeda kind of messages that were common okay. pre-9-11, post-9-11. Not necessarily incitement, but advocating. Okay, sure. All right, yeah. So we put aside the two, first two yeah. levels here. Third, they're allowed under the statute to pick any categories they want. So if they want to keep that category for which the speech falls in, that's their choice. If they want to cut that category out, they're free to do so. They just can't do so on a viewpoint basis. And at the end of the day— no, when That last clause, they can't do it on a— Brett Kavanaugh now for the fourth time trying to ask the same question, counselor. Ugh. Viewpoint basis. How does that work with terrorist speech? Sure. Um, so it's hard to say with terrorist speech because you'd have to pick the category, um, but assume that it is, you know, um, Al Qaeda. Um, you can't. You could. You can't very well say you can have the, you know, anti Al Qaeda but not the pro Al Qaeda. If you just want to say no one's talking about Al Qaeda here, they can turn that off. And at the last point, this is at the very end of the game. So you've gone through all of those things. All you have left are voluntary people wanting to talk to each other. And, I mean, people say horrible things on the telephone. Um, and that's – and I don't think we've ever thought, well, you know what, we're going to turn – we're going to turn that off because we don't want the telephone providers to be able to say – had that sort of right to, to censor. If I may, I, I mean, with some hesitance, I want to talk about Orwell a little bit. He wants to talk about Orwell. Okay, let's give it a shot. Um, and I say that with some hesitance. Um, but my reaction coming to this case was very similar to yours. Um, I looked at this, and I'm like, wait a minute. These are companies. They have their own rights. Um, we don't generally think of censorship as something from, the, from private people. That's the government. Here's how I came around on this. Maybe it'll persuade you. Maybe it won't. Uh, I came around on this to say this is something further up the food chain than that ordinary level of political discourse. This is just the type of infrastructure necessary to have. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Chekhov's, Chekhov's gun. Um, you don't have a gun hanging off the mantle unless it's going to fire. While I think it's probably almost an exceptionally bad idea to talk about Orwell, if you say, I'm going to talk about Orwell, you know what you should probably talk about? Orwell. Ugh. Have any kind of discourse at all. That's why I keep going back to the telegraph. This isn't, you know, the self, the level of discourse where they're making the content decisions that we make our decisions based on, this is the infrastructure that we need to have any sort of discourse at all. So if we say we want to have that type of infrastructure not have, you know, censorship Oh, my God. On it, oh, my God. I read ahead. Have have a oh, my God. I read ahead. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. I read ahead. Uh, my my eyes, my eyes. No, no, don't do it. 
Don't say it. No. No. Oh, no. Shit. All right. All right, kids. Let's go ahead and do this. Holy shit. Rapid, a massively increased federal government um, because it would have to control all the infrastructure. And then we would have, okay, now you can't discriminate based on this kind of infrastructure of how things work. That's not, I mean, that is Orwell, right? Um, so for me, the answer is for these kind of things like telephones or telegraphs or voluntary communications on the next big telephone telegraph machine, those kind of private communications have to be able to exist somewhere. You know, the expression like, you know, sir, this is a Wendy's. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you just say, you know, sir, this is a Wendy's? During the United States Supreme Court oral argument, is that what just happened? Did you actually just say, you know, sir, this is a Wendy's? You know, the expression like, you know, sir, this is a Wendy's. Um, that Yep. 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 Um. Okay. has to be some sort of way where we can allow people to communicate. And is that just because of the, the modern public square? I mean, Mr. Clement has said many, many, many times that there's a distinction between public and private, and that that's sort of driving his analysis. Um, also, um, the United States Supreme Court is not, in fact, a Wendy's. Analysis as to when and under what circumstances this kind of regulation can be done. And, and are you just rejecting that because you're suggesting that they merge in this situation given the nature of the communications? I'm not okay. doing that. And that's, again, you know, I'll, I'll try again to be artful. These are complicated concepts. But I think about the common carrier as a really useful tool for this court because we know that there's hard lines to draw. It's really hard to tell the difference between FAIR and Miami Herald like in the application, especially when you kind of get down to the granular level. It's really kind of hard to tell. I think it would be helpful if the court had a compass that could kind of like give us some direction of where to draw those lines. And common law, common carriage is that compass. But are you suggesting that a common carrier, as the SG pointed out, could never have First Amendment protected activity? I mean, that's why I keep going back to... Yeah, yeah. Lol, well, these are complicated concepts that you yourself don't understand. We're, we're one step, if that. I'm not even sure we're one step removed. We might just literally be the dude. You know what? Well, there's a lot of ins and outs, a lot of complications. This is a complicated case, man. I, I didn't know the dude became a Supreme Court lawyer. If he mentions the rug, I am going to lose my shit. Doesn't this have to be not at the level of entity, but at the level of sort of what exactly are they doing in a particular circumstance? Because you just seem yeah. to say, well, these are common carriers, so everything they do is conduct, and therefore we can regulate it. And I don't know that that's the way we've ever thought about this. Well, it is how the court thought about it with telegraphs, um, which I think is a useful way of, of thinking about it. I mean, my friend in the government says, um, well, you know, they're just transmitting speech. But that's totally question-begging because they have the technological ability not just to do that. The reason that cell phones don't, like, screen your calls or um, telegraphs didn't, like... Well, Mr. Nielsen, I'm sorry to interrupt, oh, sorry. but, but I, I, I think you'd agree with Justice Jackson, though, that there might be some speech that the, these carriers, even as a common carrier, would be their own. 100%, yes, And, and you do have to take that 
function by function. Yes, and that's the other part of this law, which I think is so important, is to recognize, is we don't say one word about what they can say. Um, so I would kind of disaggregate the functions of what's going on here. They have the one function, which is they are creating a message. We do nothing about that. Now, the, the telegraphs part is fine. That That part is fine. Because he's referring to case law. We discussed that when when New York was regulating Western Union. So talking about the telegraph in this context is is lucid. I know it's a bit surprising, but it is lucid as a concept. But uh, the Wendy's part, not not as much. So yes, the telegraph is relevant, not as much the Wendy's. They can say whatever they want about specific posts or anything, and that's fine. But there's a separate thing that they do, which is facilitate conversations between two people, which is like a phone. I understand that. Now, now one of the things that we've sometimes looked at in the past, this court, I mean, uh, in the common carrier world, is market power. Uh, yes, Your Honor. And how do you analyze that here. On the one hand, uh, there are network effects that one would take account of in any analysis of, of, of market power, and that might, might help you. On the other hand, uh, this is a bit unlike a telegraph in the sense that there might only be one right of way to run the wires, and it might be serious practical barriers for more than one set of wires. Here, uh, one can start a new uh, platform, at least in theory, any time. Yeah. Um, so, I guess fewer the, barriers to entry, but market effects. Sure. So the first answer is, if we are not talking about speech, if we're just in the world of conduct, then we're not talking about market power at all. Um, and we know that because cell phones are intensely competitive markets, and yet they're still all common carriers. Um, but let's move that aside. Now we're saying there's some sort of you know reason to focus on market power. Um, it's true. Um, this is not like the market power of there's just one bridge. Um, but as an economic matter, there's really no difference. Um, and I know this, here's a, a simple kind of a way to look at it. Um, Twitter um, has its, its, its platform. There's a lot of competitors for Twitter, would-be competitors, including Threads from Meta, which is backed by like one of the largest companies in the world. They invested massive amounts of money to try to break up the Twitter monopoly. And they failed miserably. So I mean, what, what do we do about, I mean, there's some legislative. What the, what the fuck are you talking about? I, I, I don't I even know. I don't even 100% know what you're talking about. Uh, the next Twitter probably isn't Twitter. Uh, the next Twitter is something completely different. Probably. Because Twitter was different. There wasn't something like Twitter until there was. Right? Uh, so the next, and Instagram's different than Twitter. And, you know, there's a lot. Uh, so the next thing is a different thing, probably. And Twitter isn't guaranteed the future. Uh, no one is. I mean, there was once a MySpace, and there was once a Friendster, and at one time they had a lot of market power, and now they don't. And Facebook, even these days, is like, uh, the Facebook platform is significantly diminished compared to its one, once great heights. Facebook, Meta, owns a lot of things, but Facebook itself isn't what it once was. Uh... Competitors come and go. This idea that the people that are participating now will always be the power is is a little bit of a conceit that is kind of a little silly with a little bit of retrospect. Not for nothing, of course, there was a time in the not-too-distant past when they were talking about the newspaper barons and how much power they had and Carnegie and those kind of people, right? And don't, don't argue with people who buy ink by the barrel. There was a time when the newspaper barons had all the power, and now they don't have as much power as they used to. And th there, you know, and th it, there was competitors for the technology, competitors for eyeballs. Um, you know, it's it, the next the next thing that's going to compete with Google or Facebook or any of these people. Just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you ha you're going to have success, and just because you have no money doesn't mean that you don't. There could still be a nascent person who comes onto the scene and explodes the scene, and it's a completely new social network from nowhere. 
I mean, you know, they have to have a unique value, value proposition probably, but you know, if they can do it, they can do it. So like, I'm not even sure what we're talking about this, this, at this point, it's almost like you're arguing that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and any, you know, and snap and, and whoever else are always going to be these huge market leaders. They'll be using these and, and YouTube for that matter. There'll always be huge leaders. There will never be in competitors for these services. These services will last forever. Uh-huh. Okay, sure. That that definitely sounds like something that totally is going to happen. Uh, you know, these this this is the end. This is my this is the end, my friend. The the current social media is all that we'll ever have and there will never be any competitors for these groups and these these companies will never fail. These companies will never fail. We'll never have a time when there's no longer a when when what's Instagram because Instagram has failed or whatever you know there's no, there's never going to be a time where these things have failed where even Google has failed Alphabet has failed you know if you go look up at the S and P 500 you know for example from the start of the 20th century and go look up the S and P 500 from the end of the 20th century there's a very different list in those two groups wow I know the big the big businesses that were you know the leaders the the tyrants the the industry tyrants the industry leaders of their day are all dead they're all dead you know they, they all they all failed and eventually you know even even the uh, east india company failed eventually although it took them a hell of a long time so i mean you know it's like I mean, either you continue to provide a service people like, or you don't. And eventually, eventually, you know, I, I, like, I don't even know what we're talking about right now. I'm so confused. What are we talking about? I don't even know what's happening. Where am I? I don't. I don't like any of these things. The findings here about market power. What do we? What deference do we owe those, if any? I would think considerable deference, Your Honor. Um, this is a sovereign state. We don't usually treat states like the FTC. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but anyone remember AOL? Anyone remember when AOL was the internet, basically, for, for all intents and purposes? AOL was so big that they bought Time Warner. Anyone remember that? How did that turn out? Oh boy, oh boy, AOL is still dominant all these years later, man, oh man, it's amazing. AOL just continued to run the industry, and AOL, there is, the internet and AOL are basically synonymous, even today. Is that how it turned out? Don't think so. DC, where we subjected to you know arbitrary and capricious hard look review, um, the state is entitled to make determinations as a matter of law uh, as to how things are. And obviously, at some point, it might be so far afield. But some, I sure hope that the states get you know some deference on such important questions from this court. Mr. Nelson, can may, I just oh, sorry, go ahead, Chief. Um, it, oh. This may be the same question that Justice Gorsuch was asking. But does the nature of the economy uh, at issue matter to us? I mean, the, uh, the social media platforms, the Internet, all of that stuff, an incredibly dynamic market. Um, uh, you know, the government, maybe not so much. And, and, it's, it's, and yet, it's, it's sort of an inflection point to say that the government has the authority by categorizing the members, uh, the participants in this dynamic market as common carriers to take over extensive regulation of them, not with respect to communication, but all sorts of things. I mean, when you're talking about railroads or telegraphs, it's not just uh, uh, moving transportation. It's what the railroads look like, what the safety things they have to have, a whole range of things that, uh, you know, in the Wild West economy uh, surrounding the uh, social media platforms and the Internet uh, may be totally uh, – Inapt. Now, you know, I don't know if it comes at a time when you, you, you need to make that transition or not, but that is a very big step when it comes to the extent of government regulation. I, th I certainly think that's fair. My, react my response is going to be this is a facial pre-enforcement injunction. Um, we should at least be able to make our showing on the facts. We're quite confident that we'll be able to show not just market power, but durable, extensive market power here. Um, I, I, I actually don't think it would be even all that difficult to make that showing. So to the extent that market power is a requirement, uh, I think that 
they haven't shown that, that they're likely to, pursue, pre, uh, likely to prevail on the merits as to that, um, which is another reason why a facial injunction is just simply inappropriate. Bring, bring it an as-applied case, um, and we're happy to litigate that. It's really hard to, to what's well, facially, they can pick a few examples and then say the whole thing fails. Mr. Nielsen, what besides market power, I want to give you a chance to elaborate on your definition of common carrier. I mean, you've said conduct, market power. What else? Sure. So the main requirement of common carrier, this is where common carriage and public accommodation are, if not you know, cousins, maybe twins, um, is it has to be open to the public, um, which means that it's not a private associational group or something like that. You hold yourself out open to the public with non-differentiated contracts. You have this is a contract with everybody. So that's the very first one. The second is it has to be the type of industry that has traditionally been regulated as such. So for public accommodation, that's your inns and your restaurants. Uh, for uh, common carriage, that's where you're talking about things like bridges and, and telecommunications. But um, then you get into the problem of having to draw the analogy, right? I mean, ju- the chief just called the Internet kind of like the, the Wild West of the Internet, and the Internet looks a lot different. Even each of these platforms has different functionalities within it. So, you know, when you extend comment, when you when you call, you've got grist mills and then railroads and cable companies. Mm-hmm. Each time you encounter something new that might qualify as a common carrier, you have to make a decision. Does it does it fit the bill or not? Sure. Um, so I guess I, I can keep going further. That's why some courts have said, well, maybe there's additional requirements that we put on common carriage. One is market power, which is not everybody says that. I don't know how that works with cell phones, um, but they've said, well, you need market power. And the other was it has to be somehow invested with a public interest. And here, under that, we know that if it's state action to block somebody from your Twitter account, how can that not be infected with a public interest? What the fuck are you talking about? State action to block someone from your Twitter account? What the fuck are you talking about? Who's talking about state action? What what the fuck are you talking about? State action if 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 the what the fuck are you what's going on? Thank you. Um, Justice Thomas? Justice Alito? Justice Sotomayor? I have a problem with um, laws like this that are so broad that um, they stifle speech just on their face, meaning um, I think that's what the government's been trying to say. If you have a particular um, type of speech that you want to protect against or, or promote, it would be one thing to have that kind of law. but. We have a company here, Discourse, who's also a direct messaging app. And there's no question that your law covers them. But they tell us that their whole business model is to promote themselves to a particular message and groups of messages. So they're not doing it indiscriminately. You're basically saying to them, if they're out there and they're a common carrier, they can't have this mis- this kind of business model. Well, I mean, two responses, if I may, Your Honor. The first is, as to the particular company, we're only talking about the three largest, maybe more, depending on who falls within the 50 million, the largest telecommunications companies on earth. We're not talking about. Oh, so, the, else. so you, they're, okay. So, but as to the second point. You're agreeing with them that the, basically yeah. this law is aimed towards them. To, to, yes, to the largest. We've never disputed that. But even if you agree with all of that, I, 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 I disagree with you, but I understand that there's still applications of this law that should be allowed to go into effect. I don't see how they can say that they can kick somebody off for off-platform speech of their grandmother. That can't be. Or because they don't like it where you live in Texas. You know, they, you live in El Paso and not Dallas, so you're not as valuable to the advertisers, so we're going to kick you off. Surely that can't be okay. What? Justice Kagan? Just, just Two very quick ones on the deference to the legislative findings point. Okay, um, I'm not sure who I needed to tell this, but maybe don't hire your Supreme Court lawyer off Wish.com. 
My memory is that there was a trial in Turner Broadcasting. Yes, Your Honor. That's Turner, too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a, may, maybe there'll be a Paxton, too. I'm not sure how. Right, but there wasn't out. just uh, there wasn't just Congress said this. That's good to go. There was a trial about that, right? Sure, Your Honor. Yeah. Um, and like I said, we're happy to, to go to trial. But that's course, all I wanted okay, to ask oh, there. Course, and then on, on common carrier. Um, if a company says we're not a common carrier, we don't want to be a common carrier. We're carrying a lot, but we're not a common carrier. Can the state make them into a common carrier? The state, that, that's a great question. Um, and that was the first question I had when I came to this case. Um, the answer is no. Uh, if you are not a common carrier, you can't suddenly become a common carrier. That's why I think it's important to think of it as a compass to kind of tell you where the line is. But... Not for nothing, but I'm not sure compasses are good at locating where a line is. I would urge um, the court, if you're interested, again, we've heard, you know, read Professor Volok's article. One thing that really struck me as strange was, well, wait a minute, they have terms of service, so how can they be a common carrier? Because if you have terms of service saying you can't do this. And this court addressed that very problem. Um, the, case, the case that he cited um, is New York um, uh, Central v. Lockwood from 1873, where the court said you can't just get out of the duties of common carriage by contract. If you're a common carrier, you're a common carrier unless you stop opening yourself up to the public. Seems a little circular, but I'll end there. Yeah. Sure. Just spirit. I just yeah, I, I'm not really sure the justices are buying literally anything you're saying right now. Justice Kavanaugh's like, you're talking in circles? And all the other justices seem to also be kind of confused, which is pretty understandable because I'm not sure what we're talking about anymore. want to get a clarification. So you said that Facebook could geofence and just pull out of Texas? Was that Of correct? course. Of course, Your Honor. Okay, yeah. because I, I was just confused. Mr. Clement was pointing out, you know, that according to the provisions of the law, you couldn't. And I'm looking at 143A.002. Mm -hmm. And it says... You know, that you can't censor users' expression, ability to receive information, et cetera, based on a user's geographic location in this state or any part of the state. So you don't understand that to say, well, based on your location in Texas, we're not going to let you post content? Your Honor, this is one of the prohibitions of the law, that, uh, that they can't um, – uh, let me say it a different way, if I, if I may. There is a provision of the law, which is the jurisdictional hook, that says who is subject to this law at all. If you choose to do business in Texas, then this provision kicks in, and you can't discriminate against people after you've chosen to do business in Texas based on the status of there in Texas. But if you don't want to do business in Texas at all, that's a separate provision, and you can get out of Texas. This is the prohibition on what you can't do. If you choose to do business in Texas, you can't darn well discriminate against somebody because they're in El Paso. And doing business in Texas is, is what? Just allowing Facebook users to sign up in Texas? Or is it, you know, Facebook accepting ad money from Texas? Texas corporations? That question has not been resolved by any of the Texas courts, because none of them have been. Um, but as I read it, it is you have to have, you know, customers in Texas. You've entered into contractual relationships with Texans. Thank you. Justice Jackson? So Justice Barrett had exactly my same thought, and I just want to clarify. So this doesn't speak, in your view, to a business decision not to offer services in Texas because, for example, their requirements are too burdensome. Instead, this is you're offering business in Texas and everywhere else, but you are pro prohibiting them from discriminating against people on the basis of their geography, meaning they're in Texas. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal, Mr. Clement? Um, so I don't know what just happened. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why Mr. Paxton couldn't find a better lawyer than this guy. Uh, I'm not sure who makes that decision, but... Um, Maybe I should throw in a bid for the Solicitor General's Office of the State of Texas because apparently they need help or something. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not even 100% sure what we're talking about for a lot of that portion of the argument. 
I mean, I know what Paul Clement and I know what Preligar were talking about. I, I know exactly what they were talking about. I'm not 100% sure what, what we were talking about with him. Except we were talking about Wendy's for some reason. And I, I don't know. Maybe everyone has the right to a Frosty. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't understand what happened. Sir, this is not a Wendy's. I'm going to die. I, 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 I am still, I'm still gobsmacked. I am still gobsmacked. That was the line that I had read where I basically collapsed. I was like, I can't, cause I accidentally read it. It was like four lines down from where we were at the time. And I was like, I can't believe that in four sentences or something, this guy is going to say, sir, this is not a Wendy's. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a while. Uh, the 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 mention the repeated mentioning of Lochner wasn't great either, because like no no one wants to talk about Lochner. Uh, no one wants to talk about that. Um, but at least Lochner was a Supreme Court case in era. I mean, there there is that. Uh, it's not really something anyone really wants to talk about. But uh, you know, uh, um. Uh, Wendy's, however, somehow gets a shout out at the U.S. Supreme Court, so I guess that's nice. Um, okay, let's listen to Paul Clement wrap this up with, you know, things that are relevant to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Just a few points in rebuttal. First of all, as to the common carrier, the two classic elements of common carrier status are missing here. One is that you just put transmitted or carried messages from point A to point B. That's not what's going on here. We use the word in our, our brief and from this court's cases, uh, disseminate. Disseminate means to spread broadly. That means you're in the expressive enterprise business. There's zero tradition of treating entities in the expressive enterprise business as common carriers. And then the, the other factor is there really is like an essential facility. You know, the telephone wires used to go, the copper wire, the last mile to every house in America. So if you were kicked off Ma Bell, you were really out of luck. This is the opposite situation in the Internet where you have lots of other choices. This is just not a common carrier. Not that that really is talismanic under the First Amendment anyways. Justice Thomas made that point back in Denver tele tele uh, carrier case, and he had it exactly right there. Now, second, public accommodation. I wouldn't be worried about any other accommodation law, public accommodation law, no other public accommodation law prohibits discrimination on the basis of viewpoint and applies exclusively to speakers. That is a First Amendment red flag that you're trying to limit speakers' ability to discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. That's just a frontal assault on editorial discretion. Every other public accommodation law that I'm aware of works differently. Third point, protecting kids. If you're at all concerned about protecting kids on the Internet, that should be a vote in our favor in this case okay i really could have done without the think of the children argument paul clement i i'm sorry paul clement you're absolutely one of my absolute heroes i think that i think that you're a once in a generation talent along with your mentor theodore olson who is also a once in a generation talent you are you are potentially today the best living supreme court advocate alive uh, you are my respect for Paul Clement is basically endless. He is he is so good, but I really really could have done without the think of the children argument. That put a really sour taste in my arc, in my mouth. That that's some bullshit. Because if you can't do viewpoint discrimination, that disables us from doing many of the things that our companies try to do to protect youth online. I mean, the, the idea that, okay, we're going to have to choose between having, if we have suicide prevention, we have to have suicide promotion to avoid viewpoint discrimination. That should be a non-starter. And protecting kids is important, even as to the disclosure provision. Uh. There is a record on this case at page 161 of the joint appendix. Uh, a witness from Stop Child Predators testified and said these disclosure provisions 
give a roadmap to predators to figure out why their messages aren't getting to children so they can figure out why they got bounced and they can try again and sort of work their way around. So the last point, and I think this is an important one to end on, this idea that somehow we're in, in you know, a, 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 a get behind the eight ball because we brought a facial challenge. There is a, pro, a proud tradition of facial challenges in, to vindicate First Amendment rights in this country. That's how many of these cases have been brought. There's an equally proud tradition of getting a preliminary injunction against a law that is chilling speech. Now we're doing a and flag as the, the general pointed out, I mean, the party presentation rules have to be foundational here. If we had gone into the district court and said, this is unconstitutional on its face, and they said, no, it's not because of Gmail, we could have had a fair debate about that. We could have modified our complaint if necessary. That's a difficult issue. As I said, the only court that I've seen that, that deals with it directly said Gmail is not a common carrier. But in all events, we could have litigated all of that. But the plaintiff's burden is not to think of any theory the government can come up with appeal and then foreclose it in the district court. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. All counsel, the case is submitted. I could have done without the appeal to a motion at the end. I could have done without the flag waving, and I could have done without the think of the children. So not not my favorite rebuttal close. But, you know, that's okay. But Pray Lagar was still the best. She 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 is just too beautiful. It is it is too it is not fair. Pray Lagar was Miss Idaho twice. This is like and and, and, she, and she's this good. Um that's that's just unreasonable. That's just unreasonable. No no well actually three times if you count the junior pageants. So yeah. She was Miss Idaho three times. Um so that yeah, so and she, and she's kicking absolute ass and taking names. So, uh, but uh, yeah, the I could have done without the think of the children and the uh, the uh, flag waving at the end. But I think you can justifiably rescore this based on Texas's sorry presentation. I went into this pretty confident. Well, I went into it optimistic. I'm not sure confident is quite right. Confident sounds overstated. I went into it optimistic that the Fifth Circuit decision would be upheld. And thanks in no small part to Texas's advocate, I am less confident. Because as one of the people pointed out in chat, something I've said before, which I believe is true, when it comes to oral arguments, you cannot win your case in oral argument at the Supreme Court, but you can lose. You can't win at oral argument, but you can lose. And yeah, this this was this was more on the he's doing damn active damage to his side. So I I would justifiably rescore the probabilities based on this. So now I would imagine that we're looking for a narrower decision if we get one that affirms either either one. And you could and they might I I think. I think the Supreme Court is likely going to try to come up with a decision that speaks to, that upholds something in one of the two statutes. I don't think they're going to strike both statutes completely down. They're definitely not going to uphold Florida's in full. That seems incredibly unlikely. Florida's provisions had, a, had some special protections for politicians. They literally put a carve out in the Florida version that basically said you have to host political candidates and they gave them the, like special protection as like no n n no that's that's that that's not going to fly right so that that that's not going to fly so florida's version definitely is not going to survive um there are some there's some stuff in florida stuff with notice provisions though in terms of the notice of the rules and having to make them clear, so those provisions might withstand the test of the, the test here. And as for Texas, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the Florida, I'm not sure what the U.S. Supreme Court is going to do. But if I had a bet, if I had a bet, they're going to come up with something narrow. They might overturn. They I, they might overturn. They might overturn everything at, with guidance. Right, so they might overturn everything with some guidance or some notes on a forward-looking basis, or they're going to uphold small parts with some notes. They're not going to do anything, I think, overly dramatic 
right now because, well, the Supreme Court is conservative in every possible sense. They don't want to do things. And it is a volatile area, and there's not a lot of case law that's out there. And they don't want to... They don't want to speak incredibly broadly because we don't know what other states might want to do in the future. Of course, because if Florida and Texas can do this, then so can Oregon and California and Illinois. And they might be able to do it in ways that conservatives don't like, depending on exactly what we want to do. So we do want to make a decision without breaking everything, which is the tricky part, right? You want to you want to you want to fix it without breaking everything. So that, that is also the problem for the legislature, right? So it's like the problem, the problem is conservative speech is being unduly censored. It's like, okay, well, how do we fix that without also breaking everything? It's particularly when it comes to the First Amendment. And I don't think that I agree that you can't treat this as a, as a common carrier. That doesn't make sense in principle that you can't treat it as a common carrier. I don't really think there's enough daylight between what the telegraph does, which by the way, for some of you who apparently don't know what a telegraph is, that's the old Morse code. It's when you had a switch, you had a switch that went right? You just have a person with a key literally sending messages in Morse code that went on a wire, right? So you and that sends an electrical impulse on a wire and goes 2000 miles and is received by another key that sends out the thing do, 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 right and that's that's the telegraph so that that's the telegraph it's when you're sending it's when you're sending digital pulses using a key a, a hand key that's the telegraph since i apparently have to explain that to some people but i don't think that really and it's in the case of both the telegraph and the telephone you have you know you, you i i guess maybe you're not broadcasting but I don't really know that there's enough in it to say, well, they're not broadcasting. I mean, because, you know, what is what is a broadcast, I suppose, in some sense, um, is a little tricky. Like, you know, how many people are sending the message and how many people are receiving the message, you know, is, is not necessarily clear. Particularly if you think about a phone line. Like, how many people are on the call and how many people are receiving the call, right? So, it's not necessarily clear how many people are in that. Is that different? Because, you know, if you had... You know, everyone in the nation on the phone call is that different than a broadcast because it's it's only a multicast. Is that different? I'm not really sure that that strikes me as different. And also, it's not really clear because it's like sort of like a newsletter in some way or something like that. So, yeah. And uh, so I don't I don't really I don't really think the distinction comes down to whether it's broadcast or not. That that doesn't seem quite right to me. It's true that I mean I suppose you could say that the telegraph and the telephone didn't broadcast, but I'm not sure that that is a legal limitation as much as just a technical limitation, and I'm not sure the technical limitation matters. The fact that the telephone doesn't broadcast isn't, you know, it's just a feature of how it was created. But I'm not sure there's anything that makes the legal difference between the two. And particularly when you're talking about sending someone else's message, which again is the whole point here, right? We're sending someone else's message, which is much more akin to the telephone and telegraph or, you know, the parcel carrier. We're sending someone else's letter, the messenger service. We're sending someone else's letter. And the fact that, you know, it's a broadcast, I'm not sure really is either here nor there. So I can definitely see some of this stuff getting... Uh, I can definitely see the Supreme Court upholding some of this stuff. Um, it'll be a little unlikely for them to uphold the Fifth Circuit completely. No thanks to Jackass, who I'm not sure what he was talking about, but somehow Wendy's got involved. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't understand how Wendy's got involved in this discussion, but it somehow did. Um. So, you know, yeah. okay, so we're, 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 we, yeah, I think the Supreme Court is likely to come out with a narrow decision and probably like some of this stuff, unless they just want to kick the can completely down the road for some reason, which they might also do that too. And, uh, 
but I, I, I think they're going to want to give some kind of guidance looking forward, you know, on some of this. They're going to want to try to, like, provide some sort of map to help the legislatures figure out what the hell they're supposed to do about these problems, I would think. Unless, you know, so, yeah. All or nothing on a facial challenge? No, not necessarily. No, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be by component to the extent it can be broken apart. And that's fair enough because the statutes both have multiple different parts. They have multiple severable components by their own terms. So that's no problem. If he really was from Texas, he said, would have said Whataburger. I tell you what, Whatabur Whataburger is massively out of overrated. Who decided that Whataburger was supposed to be a good, who, who's trying to convince people that Whataburger is a good restaurant? Whataburger sucks. Of the many things of Texas to be proud for, Whataburger isn't, isn't it. At least Dairy Queen makes good ice cream. They can be proud of that. How about that one? Isn't the a real argument nothing they can do because interstate commerce? No, that isn't the, the real argument, right? Because ca Congress can preempt the field. So Congress could pass a law that preempts the field, but they haven't. And much, much by their own choice to some degree. I mean, CDA 230 does do it to some degree, but not completely. I mean, that was sort of part of the debate, the degree to which 230 does or does not preempt. And I don't think... I don't think that's what's going to be the thing. I don't think that the preemption of 230 is what's going to really be driving this. I could be wrong, but I, I don't really I don't really think the Supreme Court is eager to get into the finer points of 230 right now. You know, I don't really think they're going to get into what is good faith. I don't think they're really going to get into what otherwise objectionable means. I don't really see them doing that. So I don't really see them relying on 230. I don't really see them saying preemption because if they say preemption then they have to answer those questions and i don't think they want to right now so i think they're going to look for another solution other than preemption so congress certainly could pass a law but other than 230 no law applies i don't think and uh therefore if congress hasn't preempted the field it's therefore naturally left to the states because that would make sense Peanut Buster Parfait. Yeah, you know. And Congress isn't going to do anything. It took them long enough to pass the Communications Decency Act in the first place. And it's turning 30 years old pretty soon. Culver, Culver is better than Dairy Queen. I respect that. I respect that choice. So I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really looking forward to this. But I think the Texas Advocate kind of sucked. Somehow we got into a Wendy's. I, I don't know. I don't know. It broke me. It broke me inside. It broke me inside. Was he trying to make a joke? It didn't work. The CDA was passed using the Save the Children argument. That's true. But then again, it was passed by an act of Congress. So <laughs> that's a little bit different. I mean, it's a law. So their motivations are a little immaterial. Um, but yes, it was passed using the Save the Children's argument. But it's not a, it wasn't a good argument here for Paul Clement, I don't think. You know, think of the children as kind of a lazy argument. You know, because it's like, you know, there's better ways to make that argument. And Paul Clement made it way too explicitly. If he wanted to make that argument, he should have been more subtle about it. And uh, he didn't do subtle. He went kind of for the throat. And I, I just have found it distasteful. Wendy's does have decent nuggets. That's true. And their Frosty is good. And they have a good burger. Wendy's is just a good restaurant. All And their chili is good. Wendy's is a good restaurant, generally speaking. I like Wendy's. Wendy's is a good restaurant. Good, good experience. Is there a timeline for decisions? Not really. The end of June is kind of the only timeline there is. Although last term they went past that, which was kind of amazing. But uh, 
the last day of June is typically the drop dead date. So other than that, who knows? When needs to be okay? Okay, what is your, well, I mean, what's your favorite place? What's your favorite, you know, um, large-ish chain for a burger? If uh, Wendy's is Wendy's is okay, what's your favorite uh, large-ish chain? Or uh, maybe nationwide chain should be better because if we're gonna do more local chains, we could probably find a better pick. Cookout's pretty good. But if we're gonna try to find a nationwide, nationwide chain, it's like, what are, what are we doing for a burger? in and out in and out it's a solid call. I respect that. in and out it's a solid call. I think it's a little overrated, but it's a very good experience. So I respect that. Chick-fil-A does not serve a burger. That's why I was very specific in what I said. Because I didn't want Chick-fil-A as an answer. So you lose, sir, if you're not paying attention. If uh, Five Guys wasn't so outrageously expensive, Five Guys would be a worthy, worthy candidate, but they're just so expensive. In and out isn't national. Uh, that's fair. That's true. It's not. It's a very large chain, but it's not national. That's fair. Burger King, but now there's taste like sadness. Fair. I was trying to find pictures of Prey Lagar from her pageant days, but I couldn't find one. I mean, they've got to be out there somewhere, right? Because she was Miss Idaho three times. She's so smart. She's so smart. She's just really, really good. And she's calm and she has really good framing. There's definitely natural talent in there. Yeah, there's definitely natural talent in there. White Castle? White Castle sucks. Are you really bringing White Castle into this discussion? Seriously? I've eaten at White Castle twice and both times I got sick. I don't like their food. White Castle sucks balls. Sonic's okay. They make a good hot dog too. Dairy Queen's food sucks. Their shit, their, their ice cream is great, but Dairy Queen's food is garbage. I mean, you would think that they could figure out how to make not garbage food, but their food sucks balls. Taco Bell has a new menu coming out. I don't know if it's happened yet, but they have a new menu coming out, so that's exciting. Dairy Queen cheese curds are legit. Respect. Crystals? Crystals sucks, yeah. McDonald's? McDonald's isn't half bad sometimes. It's not great. And they did just do a revision on their um, their food. Uh, it was a, it was a, they, they did just try to make their, I think, um, they switched to non-frozen meat for all their burgers. There was, there was a press article about it, so you can go read it up. But I think McDonald's recently switched to non-frozen beef for all their beef, for all their burgers. And they recently made some other tweaks to their items. So and they changed their prepping and, and cooking method. So they're a little bit different. So you can go look into that. McDonald's has gone better, yeah. Flex pricing, yeah. <laughs> By uh, well, if they had come at it the other way, they wouldn't have gotten in such trouble. They if they got in such trouble for the way they framed it, right? If they come at it the other direction, they would have not had such problems. So like, oh, we need to have flex pricing so we can increase prices with as demand gets higher in the day. If they had just come in at the other way around, they wouldn't have had such a problem. We need flex pricing so we can offer discounts when things aren't as busy. And so we can offer people a, a, a cheaper experience when things aren't as busy or, or, or our stores aren't as packed. So if they come out the other way around as talking about a discount instead of an increase, they would've been fine even though they're exactly the same thing. So shame on them for not figuring out that framing. Yeah, discount at non-peak hours. If they had just come at it from the exact opposite direction, they would have been fine. We need flex pricing to offer more, so it can be more expensive during peak, as opposed to we need flex pricing so it can be cheaper during non-peak non hours. I mean, it's the exact same thing, but one cell is a lot better than the other. I mean, duh.
Shake Shack. Shake Shack is a good burger. And also, um, uh, what's the other one? Shake and, uh, shake, uh, steak and Shake. That's pretty good. Shake and Steak. That's a really good burger. Yeah, they couch that wrong. Yeah, yeah. So they just came at it from completely the wrong direction. And it would have been great because they could have advertised it as a discount, right? It's be like, you know, our menu is like, you know, instead of saying, you know, menu price three fifty, but now it's five dollars, you know, so therefore it's now what is that, roughly? And now I have to do math. Fifty percent more expensive. Give me a break. Right? So instead of saying fifty percent increase, all they have to do is say, Oh, it's five dollars. But now we're offering at three fifty. Now it's basically a third off. Right? And that sounds a shit ton better, even though they're literally the same thing. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We know how expensive food has gone. Come to Wendy's during off hours for a discount. Yeah, I mean, come on, dog, guys. Jeez. I mean, just think about it for two seconds, Lord. You know? They need a lesson from men's warehouse. They need a lesson from thinking about it for three seconds. That's what they need a lesson in. They need a lesson in thinking about it for three seconds. Wouldn't off hours become busy hours? Well, even if that's true, they still win. Right, because if the off hours become busier, then more people come into their store. That's good for them, they're happier. So they win no matter what happens, right? It's like, well, if more people come in during off hours, then that's good. So, you know, they're happy, everyone's happy. One of the more distressing things I learned was like how powerful saying things are on sale are. I, was it JC Penny who, who tried this that was a failure or was Sears? I forget, it was one of them. So JC Penny's or Sears, I forget what, which one. Um, this is going a while back, obviously, when these you know companies you know had customers. So it's a while ago, but if you went into a JCPenney or you went into a Sears or whatever, it was JCPenney's? Okay, thank you. I knew it was one of them. If you went into a JCPenney's, you know, back in the day, it would say, it would have the item, it's, it would have the item marked at a price and then it would be like, you know, they were basically always, it's like, we're always discounting, right? It's like, you know, 30% off sale, 50% off sale, right? So everything was, there was always a perpetual sale. Right, it was always a perpetual sale, right? The price was marked, you know, on the thing, it's like, oh, the price is $50, but it was never really $50. You know, the price was always real, it was always $30 because there was a perpetual sale, per, 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 you know, perpetually. And um, so JCPenney, you know, they got complaints about this. You know, the fact is like, well, why don't you just make the price the price, right? I mean, if the price is really $30, why don't you just mark it $30? Why, why do you market $50 and then offer us a discount to 30? You know, why are you in a perpetual sale? Why don't you just offer it at the price it is? So JCPenney tried it. They tried it. They's like, okay. So they changed all their prices. They, they remarked everything to the actual price. And like, okay, we don't have sales anymore. Now we just have everyday low prices. Everything is now, and it cost no more than it did before. And it was a complete failure. It was a complete failure. People hated it. Because people like the feeling like they're getting a discount, even though that didn't really exist. You know, so it's like it was a total and absolute failure. So it's one of those things is like, man, it really depresses you because the price didn't change. It was exactly the same price in reality, right? It was always $30 in reality. It was always the same price in reality. It's like one version is like, oh, we're, we're pretending it's $50, but we'll offer it to you for you, friend, my friend, special price, $30 versus it's just $30. People hated it. People hated it. It was a total failure. So there's something depressing in there about the human condition.
So I think they tried it for like a year or two years before they gave up and went back. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those discounts where the always on sale actually got them in trouble. They have to send it one day at normal price because the state's AGs got busy. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of states do that. Like they say, like there 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 are a lot of ways that like um, where you can't have these perpetual sales. A lot of a lot of places try to offer try to make laws against it because it was like it, it was stunt. so a lot of states or a lot of jurisdictions at least pass laws like things can't be perpetually on sale the one that the one that they uh they really did have a problem with that they kind of stuck with where the states really did crack down was the going out of business sale that one stuck so it's like dude you can't have a going out of business sale all the time that's just not cool if you're if you're you can't have a going out of business sale and then not go out of business you can't do that so that one's still in the books right so you can't have the perpetual store closing going out of business sale that you can't do but um a lot of they tried to do it. It's like, well, you just can't offer sales all the time. So they just, you know, you know, periodically would be like, you know, for 10 minutes, you know, some random day or something. It's like, yeah, now it's $50. And so a time when no one's in the store and stuff like that. So it didn't really matter. They found ways around it. But yeah, they, they found ways around it to make the state's AGs happy. So it wasn't perpetually on sale. But yeah, they, yeah there, there's a thing in there. Uncivil law memberships are in fact sale for 99 cents. That's true. We offer we are offering a special discount this month. We are offering a special discount this month. Normally uncivil law memberships are three dollars, but we are offering a special discount this month. Uncivil law memberships are only 99 cents. So if you join this month, you get to lock in that price at 99 cents instead of the normal three dollars. So make sure to subscribe to Uncivil Law today. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, good times. Yeah, maybe we should try, maybe I should try that more. Maybe I should try that more. See if that works. I know, it is a discount. I know. On sale now, I know. It is it is great. All right, guys. I, I mean I mean I don't even necessarily have to lie because we do have the upper memberships, right? We do have a membership at the six ninety nine tier. So I could be like, you know, our normal memberships, because what's normal? I mean they do exist perpetu they do exist normally, so it's not even a lie. Right? So I don't even have to lie be like our normal membership because it is a membership that exists normally our normal membership is 699 but because of you because i like you guys i am now offering even though i was offering before but i don't have to make that part particularly clear i am now offering a special membership at only 99 cents that's right instead of the usual 699 now only a special membership for 99 cents so get in on that and get our special membership offer limited time offer because you know there's the heat death of the universe limited time offer make sure to get in today there there is something in there maybe i should start doing that maybe that's the way to go <laughs> all right guys i'm gonna sign off for now we've had lots of fun we've had we've had lots of fun all right i'm gonna sign is anyone streaming that i could send you to Children are free. <laughs> yeah, ch children, children, we have free candy. We have free candy here at Uncivil Law for the children. That, there's no way that can be misunderstood. Reach into my pockets. We've got some chocolate for the children. Oh, man. Uh, let's see. I'm going to send you. What is. What? What is already streaming about 
Um, do I want to send you Law Talk with Mike's Way or Artie's Corporate Fiction or Robert's Way? When is when is uh, Natalie Lorchik going? She's going March 20th. That's tomorrow. She schedules her things a whole day in advance. That's too long. I'll send you Law Talk with Mike's Way. Why not? All right, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Until later.